All right, I'm coming in. I just have to change the um, tags. I'm going to try to do it in an easier way tonight that I don't have to type them. I'm just going to try to copy the ones that I have from last night. Throw them in there. I'll be right there. We're going to go right into the um, trial testimony. So I am going to put the, um, come on, come on. I'm going to get the thing out now. You know, I said if you want to part, you have to speak now. I'm just going to put it into the craft group. Uh, if you're not in Slack, and, and listen, I know I haven't added people. I had an attack of vertigo this afternoon, and it was bad. I had to, like, lay down for I don't know how many hours. But I'm okay. So... Um, I did, obviously, I didn't get that done. Obviously, I didn't get to a bunch of emails or anything else. Um, shouldn't say anything else. I did do stuff out. I had made videos. I um, did stuff as much as I could do. I did a little, even a little, little diamond painting before I got really sick. Okay. Let me see. What am I going to do right now? I have to go in here and add the tags. Oh no, shoot. That was stupid of me. Where? Nothing, I just have to go back and do something because I copied the invitation and, and I, now I have to go copy the tags again. Okay. Yeah, everything's fine. I'm, I'm live. Okay. I just can't see the chat right now. Okay, okay here, here's the, uh, there's, oops, that's the wrong, I'm doing everything wrong tonight. Copy, invite, copy the invitation. That's what I thought I did. Okay. There's the invitation. I'm leaving it there. All right, that's where I'm leaving it. And now I have to go copy the tags again. So if you're coming, you need to get your butt over. Wait a second. Hold on a second. I gotta go get my tags again. So just hang on. All right. This is your time to get your drink or whatever you need. This will be very fast. There we go. Tags will go right in, and I'll be right over in the chat, and then we're going to go. Uh, because I, um, let me see, I probably am going to have to take a call in like, mm, maybe an hour, but an overseas call. So that's why I want to have everybody on, and everybody can just go on, and if somebody has to play me for a few minutes while I take the call, then you guys can do that. So let me see here. Back to the channel content, and back to the channel. Okay. Okay, let's see who we have. Whisper to me, teacup. Sean, Newfie, Tracy Klaus. Tracy, are you going to do this tonight? Yes or no? I need an answer. Let me know. Ozzy. Hello from Nan Under. Welcome to your first chat. What brought you here, Ozzy? Nana T. Sean, Flower Girl Phillips, Connie Coghill. Hello. Teacup, Shay Shay, Isabel. Uh, let's see. Ellen Hudson. Welcome. Linda. Moo of two. Catwoman. Where is Kitty Cat? Kitty Cat, I need to talk to you. Carolyn Parrish. I wanted to ask you about those dolls. I wanted to ask you which ones you had. I know you sent me an email, but I haven't seen you in the chat anymore. Um, I wanted to know if you had a specific one. If you hear me, please get in touch with me. Please, please, please. Um really important it's urgent 
Okay, two scooter. No, you can't get in the bathtub, scooter. Come on now. Stop it. If I knew that I would have taken I would have taken a shower. I'm not taking one right now. Um Danielle C. Treasure Cassidy. Uh, Linda Gelb. Uh, Nanate I got. Tonda. Paul Martinez. Welcome to your first poll. Uh, your first live chat with us. Maggie Smith. Two scooter. You're the one that takes a bath after midnight. Um, you can't do it, right? It's not in her contract. Uh, let's see. Kevin Leonard, how are you? Um, Gail B. Who else is here? Okay. I'm going to let Slack know that we're live. Oh, never mind. You know, this is not working. Okay. We're good. Okay. So who's coming on? Let's go. I'll tell you who we have tonight for witnesses. Here we go. Tonight. Tonight. We have. Let's see. We have. Let me see here. What are you watching, Jimmy? Oh, okay. I thought you were watching something. All right. I just want to make sure it was not somebody. Luke. Okay. All right. What I'm going to do is, let me see. Oh, that's prosecution 26. Okay. So we had 10 yesterday with, with Brent, Lacey's brother. Oh, we have Nana Patty here. I didn't hear a little bell. That was weird, Nana Patty. I heard no bell. I usually hear a bell. I wonder what happened. Did you not ring the bell? You just stormed the door down? I guess I did. I can't hear you. Oh my gosh. I know why. My volume is off. <laughs> Good. Okay. Now I can hear you. Now, no wonder I didn't hear the bell. Okay. I shut the volume off before because I couldn't, my computer started to go crazy and I couldn't get the web page down. So Jimmy's like, just shut the volume. I knew I was going to forget it. That'll going? work. I was wondering why the bell didn't go off. Okay. Let's see now. So where was I? I'm going to say, who what do we have? We have, so we did 10, which was Brent, played by Nana Patty. And then we did 11, which was Rose. And that was uh, played by Scooter. And tonight we're going to start with uh, Gwendolyn May Kempel. That's Sharon's first cousin. And then after that, we have her husband, Harvey Kempel. And I don't know how long those are. They might be relatively short. And if they are, then the next person would be um, Karen Service, Peterson's neighbor. And then we have, it looks like, let me see. Hers might be pretty long. I don't know. Just by looking at the summary, it seems like there's a lot of stuff there. And then after that, there's um, William Austin, the owner of the Austin's Christmas store. And then Tara Venable, another neighbor. And then Susan Aquino, Lacey's maternal aunt. And I am sure even if those were short, we're not going to get past that. So do we have anybody else for the judge or nobody's coming on? Let me see what they're saying. Tracy, did you say you, you want to come on or not? You're, Kevin, you're here to protect this, your star's best interest? Okay. Hi, Jessica. Deborah. Hi, T. Prang. Mrs. Prangle for my daughters. Oh, you were Mrs. Prangle? Oh, for, is that like a Mrs. Kringle? Cute. Are we number 13? Um, no, 12, right? Is it, uh, 
Yeah, 12, isn't it? Uh, I'm, I'm looking, it goes from 10. Oh, you're right, you're right. Okay, wait a second. No, we for, oh, we forgot Sandy Rickard. 12. I don't know why I wasn't thinking Sandy Rickard. So we, okay, so to add Sandy Rickard comes first, and that's Sharon's best friend. And then Gwendolyn May Kempel. So the first one will be um, Sandy Rickard. Okay. And let's see how long that is. Is that pretty long? It's not that long, that one. It's really not uh, compared to the other ones. It's actually pretty short. Hello. Hey. You're, you have a black screen. No, I'm turning my camera on. Just as, just as I got undressed and get, well, uh -oh, please make sure you get is... dressed before you turn the camera on. Okay. I'm dressed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have any of that flashing or anything. I just don't have pants on. Don't get up. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're not looking for... Who was that guy? What's wrong with my... Oh, it's not on. It's not working. There we go. I know. <laughs> I cannot see the chat, so oh, you can't everybody, see the chat? Okay. everyone in chat, I can't see. Hi, Lisa. Did I just see Lisa H? Hi, Lisa H. Okay, anybody else? You have to take an overview. Okay, I guess you're... Um, <laughs> what did you say? What's going on? What's going I said on? you have to take an overseas call. Yeah, so if I, yeah, then you guys are going to have to carry it, and you're going to have to, right. it won't be long. Yeah. No problem. I'm important like that. Okay. <laughs> it comes in on a red phone. I have a special red phone that they say, oh, there's my overseas call. <laughs> Let me make sure my phone is charging anyway. Driving me nuts. Yes, it is charging finally. Does my sound weird? Does my voice sound weird? No. Why are you doing lessons to try to change it? No, it just was frozen. I don't know why. Oh, you're home. Look at that. I just got home. I was going to soak in the tub. I thought maybe, you know, be on in a couple more hours. What made you get, which made you come home? You had a fight with Dave? <laughs> <laughs> he, got, he got pissed about all that stuff you're buying at the thrift store, right? <laughs> no, he doesn't care. He, he threw you out of the house. <laughs> I wanted to get some things done, and then <laughs> he's going to come home in a couple days, and then we're going to vote, and then um, we're going to go back down. Is it cold? Yeah, it's cold. What about you, Nana Patty, with that ice storm? I saw that on the news tonight. Yeah, we're still having free, freezing rain. I saw so, it on the news. I saw the trees. Oh, yeah, they're bad. Yeah, I saw it. I'm like, oh, that's near the Patty is. And then I saw Davida's fires, and they look bad, too. Has so, anyone heard from Davida? Yeah. I saw her post something today, and then I said to her, are you okay? And I don't know if I got a response. Did anybody she's hear good. from Davida? Yeah, she's good. Oh, she is good. Good. That's good. If they her moved time. away from her house? What? They moved away from the house? I don't know. She just said she's fine, but that her, her son had to evacuate. Oh, no. Um, Kim Miller, are you okay? Because she was on the verge of evacuation last night. Hi, C. Brown. Alicia, hello there. But she made a community post just a little bit ago, so that's how I know that. Oh, she did? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Kevin Leonard, yes, your star is here. Hi, Carol Plant. Okay, so no, no judge then, right? Oh, you can, I guess, which one are you are going to do? Um, we got those three. Who's going to be Gwendolyn and who's going to be, um, what is that, Sandy? Whatever you guys want to do. Don't matter to me. It's for, uh, for you guys. You decide. Fight it out amongst yourselves. I haven't even looked to see. <laughs> C. 
Sandy Rickard, is that where we are? Sandy Rickard, yeah. First one. You can make divinity? Okay. I think about your cookies too, if anybody wants to do cookies. You're doing shortbread, Diana? That's good. I'd like to see your shortbread. You go ahead and go first, Nana. Okay. All right. There is so, a judge part in here, too. Of uh, what part? Judge? The judge. Okay, it's good. You're going to have to be the judge. Try to follow along, Scooter, and not get lost in the chat and forget where we are, okay? Because <laughs> that. I try, try, try to stay on point here. All right. That's what I was just going to get back into chat. Yeah. Well, right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Bye. Okay, so we're at Sandy Rickard. Well, oh, gosh, hold on. Let me get a drink. Let me get to the thing. Sandy Rickard, and that's um, Sharon's best friend, the one that drove her to the park when she found out Lacey was missing. Okay, so this is the direct examination by Rick DeStasso. Do you know, did you know who Lacey Peterson was? Yes. Okay, and you also know who the defendant in this case is, Scott Peterson, is that right? Yes. Just briefly, how is it? What's your relationship to Lacey and the defendant's family? Sharon's my best friend. Sharon, her mother. Sharon, her mother, is my closest friend. And how long have you been friends? Probably about 20 years, but been very close for about the last 10. And after Lacey moved back to Modesto from St. Louis Obispo, did you also have a relationship with her? Yes. And do you feel that, you know, over the course of a couple of years that she was here, do you think that you got to know her fairly well? Yes. And just briefly, I mean, can you give me a couple, you know, a couple sentence description of how you would describe her? Sure. I have a smile on my face because that's, that's the way she was. She just would brighten up a room, vivacious, intelligent, life of the party. Was, I mean, what, was she a nice person? Oh, very much so. And would you call her friendly? Yes. Let me ask you, did you get a call on December 24th, 2002 from Sharon? Yes. Can you describe that call for the jury? Yes. Do you want me to tell the time or? Sure. Yeah. I'll ask you more questions in a minute, but just take me through that time log. Okay. When I received the call, I wasn't quite sure who was on the other end for a moment because Sharon was a little bit hysterical. And I knew that something was important, that she needed me. And I wasn't quite sure what she had said to me. But I knew that there was a problem with Lacey or Mackenzie. I didn't know what it was. I immediately went to her house. Okay. And when you got there, what happened when you got to the house? When I walked in, Ron was on the phone. Sharon greeted me at the door and almost literally fell into my arms in hysterics. Sharon did? Sharon did, and she said Lacey's missing. And, and what did you see? What, what was Ron doing at that time? Yes, he was in the background on the phone. Okay, and do you know who he was calling? He was talking to hospitals and police officers. And after, what happened next? Where did you go next? We didn't stay there long. Sharon wanted to go to the park to search for Lacey. So we left shortly after I arrived to pick up Sharon, and we went to the park, just the two of us. And what happened when you got to the park? Sharon and I were walking around the park looking for Lacey. What was going on? You know, uh, what were you doing? Basically, it was Sharon. Okay. Walking around, looking, calling her name. Mm-hmm. And just searching. And what was Sharon doing? The same. And at some point, um, did a jogger or somebody run by? Yes, there was a jogger who was in the, was the vicinity in the park, and Sharon went up to the jogger and found out that he was a doctor. Mm-hmm. And he had a cell phone. <coughs> he started calling hospitals. 
Okay, and Hold what on. happened next? Sorry, dog. I didn't know you had a service dog, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe what happened next, to my recollection, is we spotted a few more people in the park that we recognized. One was Scott in the distance, and one was Zach. Who is Zach? Zach is Amy's half-brother, Amy's brother. Okay. And did you go up to them? Zach started coming up to us, and at that time, Scott started coming towards us as well. And what happened when you first approached the defendant, Scott Peterson? Well, she said, oops. Oh, that's you, Scooter. Well, well, she said they approached. Oh, okay. Did you speak to them? I didn't, but Sharon did. And what was his de what was his demeanor? Pretty calm. Okay, and if you compare his demeanor against Sharon's, did you notice a contrast? There was no comparison. He seemed very calm, and she was pretty hysterical. Okay, what happened next? We stayed there for a bit. Sharon tried to talk to Scott a little bit. All of a sudden, more people started arriving, police officers, my husband. I called him, some more people for reinforcement, some friends. Okay, did, um, how long do you think that you were down there in the park? I'm going to guess about 15 minutes, maybe a little longer. You're saying a guess, but it's more like an estimate. It's an estimate. Okay. And after you left the park, we've heard testimony that then Sharon went back to the house. Is, is that what you did? When we left the park, we went to Lacey's house. Okay. You went back to 523 Covina. Correct. Right. And when you went up there at the house, did you ever go inside the house? No. It did, um, but... Where did you stay at the house? We were in front of the house and more people were arriving. We were basically hanging out. We weren't allowed to go in the house. Okay, and family members and other folks were arriving? Family members, friends, relatives, yes. And? Police officers. Okay, where at the house were you? Were you guys kind of, where were you standing? Pretty much on the front lawn in the street pretty much on the front lawn, taking over the neighborhood. And there were a lot of people coming? A lot of people gathered, yes. Okay, and at some point that evening, did you speak to Scott Peterson up at the house area? Yes, he came up to me. And, and who was with you when he came up to you? When he came to speak to me, I was standing there by myself on the front lawn. And where were you standing? On the front lawn. There's a diagram behind you. Do you recognize that diagram, the area at 523 Covina? You can put your glasses on if you need to. You can uh, leave her. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is it me? It's me, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm You can lead her to it. The bottom part, of course, is the street. Kevin, she's going to need a little more coaching. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. I can't get it to come up, the internet, if it's barely working. Okay, sorry. And those areas marked lawn. That's the front yard? Yes. And where were you standing when the defendant came up to you? I'd say approximately in this vicinity. Somewhere on the lawn. Correct. And it was just you? At that particular moment, I was standing by myself. Okay, but around you, you know, other parts of the street or the yard, were, were the other, there were other people. Yes. And what did the defendant say to you? He put up his hands and he said, I wouldn't be surprised if they find blood on my truck because I cut my hands all the time. I'm a hunter, I'm a fisherman, sportsman, outdoorsman. One of those terms that I can't don't recall, but something to that effect. And had you said anything to him? No. To make him give you that comment? No, he came up to me and I'm standing there by myself and I was perplexed why he said it. 
Okay, when you were down, I mean, other than when Sharon went up to him and spoke to him down in the park, had you spoke to him at all during that time during the evening? No. The, let me talk, let, let me let me leave this with, I'm sorry. At the 24th and after you talked to him, the rest of the night, did you basically just kind of do the same thing standing out there on the front lawn? Yes. And at some point, did the officers tell you to leave or say that you should probably go home? Some words to that effect. Yes, because there was nothing else that we could do, do you out, out there. Do you remember? The, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Finish. At that time of night, and we couldn't go into the house. Do you remember what time it was when you left? I'm thinking close to midnight. And again, is that just kind of an estimate? Yes. All right. Prior to the 24th, I think your prior statement was a couple of weeks or a month. Did you go to the movies with Lacey and Sharon? Yes. And did Lacey and Sharon tell you about a time when she had gotten dizzy or lightheaded while she was walking her dog? She did. She told me and Sharon at that time that she had an incident where she got a little lightheaded. And did she tell you at that time anything else about, well, I mean, did she tell you anything else about how she was feeling, about her pregnancy or her physical feelings at the time when you went to the movies? Feeling very tired, heavy and tired. Do you remember she used those words heavy and tired? She did use the word tired, and I believe she used the word heavy. And now after this, after the 24th, were you present at all? with Sharon and the, you know, the week after the 24th and into January when, when everybody was kind of getting together to try and search for Lacey and keep her picture out there. Were you with Sharon at all during that time? We were together most of the time. And, and why were you there? For support as a best friend would be. Her chauffeur, confidant, whatever she needed, I was trying to be there for her. And during that time, did you ever see in the first couple of weeks or so after the 24th of December, did you ever see Sharon try to talk to the defendant about what happened on the day of the 24th? Yes. About how many times do you think you saw her approach the defendant or just say, you know, can you tell me about what happened? That kind of thing. You know, I use the word several because it was definitely more than once. Mm -hmm. How many times? I don't know. But there were several instances when Sharon tried to get on on the one-to-one -one with Scott, and his comment was always, got to go. Okay, and would he do anything when he said that to her? Would he do anything? Mm-hmm. Other than rush off? Right. Got to go, and he left. And so those were the words you remember him using? Yes, and then on an occasion... At least one time, I remember him saying that he had to go do flyers, but always got to go. And did you ever see Sharon, you know, try to push him like, well, wait a minute, you know, I want to hear about what happened. She tried several times to get him to sit down and talk to her. And did you ever actually see him sit down and talk to her? There was one instance in the command center mm -hmm. that she did get him behind the closed door. And was that at the Volunteer Center? Yes, the Volunteer Center, Command Center, yes. Okay, th that thing at the Red Lion? Yes. And other than that time, did you ever see him or were you ever present when he sat down and told her what had happened? No. And no further questions, Your Honor. Okay, and now we have um, the cross-examination. This is by Pat Harris, who sounds a lot like... Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I believe you just testified that Ms. Rocha made numerous attempts to talk to Scott Peterson and he rebuked her attempts to talk about it. Is that correct? Correct. Were you present in Ms. Rocha's home on that night the detectives came, Detective Grogan specifically? I believe he came in and installed a recording device. Yes. And you recall that while you were there, while you were there with Mrs. Peterson, she called the house that time, excuse me, while you were there, Mrs. Mr. Peterson called the house, right? And he talked to Ms. Roca, Rocha, and specifically, he asked if he could come over to the house and talk to Sharon about the situation and what happened. Do you recall that? I recall being there when he called. 
Okay, so you recall seeing Detective Grogan shake his head and tell Sharon, no, don't let him come over. I don't recall. <laughs> you don't remember that? No. But you were in the room I, at the time. I was in the house at the time. So when they were actually installing the listening device, well, let me back up. Did you answer the phone when Scott called? That particular time, possibly, I did answer the phone a few times when Scott called. Okay, and so when you uh, turned that phone over to Sharon Rocha? Mm -hmm. You left the room at that point? I believe so, to my rec recollection. So you did not actually see Detective Grogan tell Miss Rocha, no, don't let him come over? No, not that I recall. Okay, you had been interviewed by the Modesto Police Department prior to when I believe Detective Porcini interviewed originally, is that correct? No. I'm sorry, who who interviewed you? Detective Grogan. He was your initial interview? Yes. And when Detective Grogan interviewed you at that point, your first time, you never mentioned the incident that what happened the night of uh, December 24th? When Scott said they never found blood, you, you didn't tell him at that point, did you? On my initial interview, um, will you please repeat that? On your initial interview, you said that uh, it was with Detective Grogan, your initial interview. You didn't tell Detective Grogan that this comment that you just testified to, to about Scott coming up to you and saying there's blood. If they find blood anywhere, if they find blood in the truck, I, I believe it's what you testified to today. Can I elaborate, elaborate on that? Judge? Judge? Well... First, you have to answer the question. Then you can explain your answer. Uh, you you didn't uh, mention in that. That's not true. I need to elaborate. Well, uh, Your Honor, can I get the... Wait, wait, wait a minute. She can answer the question. You said it's not true. You can explain your answer. Go ahead and... Thank you. My, my, the initial time that I talked to Detective Grogan about the hands was a day in February of 2003. Sharon and I were at a friend's home and we were sitting down making notes on things that we remembered from the 24th. And when I recalled it at that time, I called Detective Grogan right away. So it wasn't even, it was before my interview with him and the day that I called him. I can't be specific on the date. However, it was the night before Scott appeared on the date Diane Sawyer's show. I do remember that vividly because if I would have called him afterwards, my story wouldn't have any credibility. Okay, let's talk about that. All right. This was the first time that you had ever talked to anybody at Modesto Police Department. Is that your testimony? As far as other than saying hi, yes. Okay, so no one interviewed you prior to that? Nope. And now you talk about on this particular date that you were at your friend's house. What friend's house were you at the time? Patty Amador. And in fact, it was Mrs. Amador, yourself, and, and Ms. Rocha, who was all present, right? And another person. Now, who was the other person? Lynn Perrier. Sharon and I were the only two sitting at the table doing notes. They were not sitting at the table with us. Well, you said that you was you was going on what you you were reviewing notes about what you could remember on the night of the twenty fourth. Correct. Okay, and then you said as soon as you recalled, you got on the phone with Detective Grogan and you called him and you told him exactly what you remembered. Sharon asked me to yes. Actually, what happened that night, that day, is Patty Amador got on the phone first and called for about, you called about 20 minutes late, earlier and had talked to Detective Grogan, Patty did, and told you some wild rumor that you guys had all about been discussing about Lacey going to the Serenity Spa and telling some hairdresser that, or excuse me, a manicurist, that there were some weights and that she was scared to stop because he had concrete weights that he, had, that he was making. Objection, Your Honor. That's argumentative and fully speculative. It goes to the state of the mind of the entire party that was there that day. The state of the mind of the entire party is not an issue. Were you aware that that was a phone call? 
the phone call was made? No. All right. You do not recall Mrs. Amador sitting down at that house 20 minutes earlier calling Detective Grogan and telling him the story. I do not recall that. A lot of conversations took place. I don't recall it. A lot of conversations took place that day, didn't they? Oh, about that. Oh, about that day. I don't know. I'm just saying a lot of conversations over the past year and a half have taken place. Some I cannot remember. And that day in particular, you were sitting around the house uh, thinking of all the things that you could think of in order to call. Sharon and I were. Exactly. Yes. And Patty Amador, in fact, called them to tell them about this rumor. Okay, in fact, following a short time later. No, no, you, I, I don't. That's, sorry, I don't remember that. Okay, in fact, following a short time later, Sharon Rocha then placed a call to this Detective Grogan. <clears throat> and that's when I spoke to him when Sharon placed the call. Uh, she placed the call and she actually talked to Detective Grogan first. Yes. Right, for some period of time. To my knowledge. And... What you heard was Sharon Rocha telling Detective Grogan for the first time that what she recalled was Scott Peterson using the word missing. That might, uh, this was the first time that she had told the detective that. And that uh, was the phone call that she made that day. Is that correct? Objection, Your Honor. It calls for hearsay. Sustained. How does she know? She was in the room. Oh, sorry. No. How does she know that was the first time that Mrs. Rocha... Oh, let me rephrase the question. Okay, go ahead. You heard her tell Detective Grogan that Lacey, or excuse me, that Scott used the word missing. I did not hear her say that. Sharon was in the other room talking to him on the phone. Mm, okay. Okay. I okay. don't know. Oh, sorry. Is it me? I don't know what she <laughs> talked to him about. Okay. So the, then it's your testimony that basically uh, Ms. Amador was in another place talking to Detective Grogan and Ms. Rocha was in another place talking to Detective Grogan and, that, and then you got on the third phone. Objection. This misstates the testimony. Judge? Kevin, we got problems. <laughs> Just read it for yourself. To yourself. No, you're sustained. Sustained. That's not what she said. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Let, Let me, me show you what the problem is, though, for real. Look. Yeah, what's the problem? Like, no, what? look, the print. I can't. Can you pull it, it up? You should pull it up on your it, tablet, maybe. Or turn your phone sideways. Yeah, let's turn your phone like Nana Patty. Okay, but it usually gives me the option to go in a different format, and it reads out real nice. It's not doing that for some reason. So I'm having a hard time following it. But, yeah, I can go like this. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Okay. Maybe you'll have to print your, your script out next time. Highlight the parts. <laughs> Okay, now where were we? Um, sustained, that's not what she said. Okay, then explain to me how the situation worked. Patty and Lynn were in the house. Sharon and I were sitting at the table. I was unaware of Patty making that phone call at that time. Sharon went in the other room to call the detective. When she was through talking to him, she handed me the phone. And when she handed you the phone, you told Detective Rogan the story that your recollection of the 24th about Scott Peterson coming up, making the blood comment. Correct. Okay. And this was, you know for a fact, that Sharon Rocha was on the phone prior to you talking to Detective Grogan. Yes. Okay. And in fact, when you told him at that time is what you knew, if they find blood anywhere, that doesn't mean anything. And you didn't mention anything at that point about Scott saying they found blood in the truck. I didn't say in the truck. No, you didn't, did you? 
No, I don't remember saying in the truck. I remember saying on the truck. That you testified today. You're, you're testifying. Is your test, testimony today that the blood was on the truck? Is that what you remember? Were you in the truck? I believe Scott was mentioning about the doorknob, the handle, that the that area of the truck. He didn't say inside the truck. He said on the truck. Okay. So the night Scott was discussing the truck, uh, he was coming up to you discussing the truck and what possible blood on the truck. Correct. And what you told the police officer? You mentioned the word truck, did you? To my recollection, what I told the police officer was that was what I had testified to. And if I could have you take a look, I'm, I'm showing her Detective Grogan's report. Uh, it's dated uh, January 28th. And if you look at the section that's in yellow. Just read it to yourself. Okay. Just that paragraph right there. Here? Mm-hmm. Okay, I didn't. Apparently, I didn't say truck, but that's... Apparently, you never. That's what I thought I had told him. So you never mentioned truck at all. Is that correct? I thought I did. Okay. Uh, by the way, on Christmas Eve, uh, did you go to the movies with Sharon Rocha? Yes, I did. And that was from what time to what time? Approximately two to four. And so you were there at the movies on Christmas Eve because that's something you enjoyed doing? It was kind of impromptu. My family had a Christmas Eve gathering in the afternoon and Sharon tentatively had plans that evening. So we had made, we had some time and we decided to take in a movie. Sure, Christmas Eve. Sharon and I frequently went to the movies together. Christmas Eve is a good day to do things because you're off that day. Uh, you don't have to work. Right. And now we have the redirect from Rick DeStasso. I have a little bit, Your Honor. When you talked to Detective Grogan about this, did you tell him that the previous, you previously talked to him about it? Yes. And do you know if he noted this in his report? I'm not sure. Okay, let me show you his report dated July 9th. Can you just have a look at this section? Okay. And do you have uh, the page number stamped on that? Oh, excuse me. This one. Oh, hold on. That was Gergos. Hold on a minute. Oh. Uh, do you have the page number stamped on that? This one is 26027. Well, thank you. And And looking at that report... Does, you, does that refresh your memory about whether or not Detective Grogan noticed that you previously talked to him about that? Yes. A and did he? To my knowledge, yes. Objection. Of course for speculation. Well, it's in there. It's not speculation. Is it in the report? It's in the report. Uh, did you just read it in the report here? Yes. And what, to the best of your recollection, as you sit here today, you know, you've read it, you've read the report, I just showed you to refresh your memory. Yes. And then you saw what counsel was showing you about the truck or the lack of truck. Right. Okay. Other than that discrepancy of whether the blood was on the truck, I guess, or somewhere on his hands, can you tell us, as you sit here today, just what is your best recollection as you sit here today of what he told you? My reaction? No, no, no. Your recollection. Just give me the statement as you remember it. He came up to me when I was standing in front of the house, and he said, I wouldn't be surprised if they find blood on my truck, because I cut myself frequently. I'm an outdoorsman, sportsman, fisherman, something like that. And he used some kind of sporting, some kind of word. Yeah, some kind of sport sporting terminology. Okay. Do you know exactly what sporting terminology he used? No. Nothing further. Okay, now we have a recross by Pat Harris again. Judge? Mr. Harris, do you have any other questions? One second, Your Honor. Can I have one minute? Yes, of course. Uh, nothing further. Nothing further? Okay. May the swiftness be excused? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Rick Ms. Rickard. Thank you. Okay, so 
So that's that witness. Now we have to go and get our other witness. Okay, the next witness will be Gwendolyn May Kempel, Sharon's first cousin. Okay, who's Gwendolyn? Scooter, you have your script? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I do. You'll be the judge, Nana. Okay. Okay. Kevin, Scooter's going to need work. Hey, <laughs> hey, I was getting good that last time. Well, you were slipping on a lot of the lines there. I, I don't recall that way, it that way, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> she needs better equipment, um, Kevin. Okay. And Gwendolyn May Kempel, am I a younger woman, an older woman? I, really, I, don't, I know nothing about this. Neither, I've been told nothing. I didn't, I know, I don't know. Maybe we'll hear her age in here somewhere. I have no idea. But this is Gwendolyn May Kempel. She's the witness for the people. And this is actually occurring June 8th and 9th. Okay, so this is direct examination. Ms. Kempel. How are you? Well, let me just ask you a preliminary question. Do you know or did you know in your life a Lacey Peterson? Yes. And do you know a Sharon Rocha? Yes. And Lacey's family? Yes. And just how? How is it that you're related or associated with this family? Sharon and I are first cousins. And you live in Modesto? Yes, I do. And what is your husband's name? Harvey. And have you, have you and Sharon known each other, you know, basically your whole life? All of our lives, yes. And now on December 24th, 2002, where were you? At my home. And did you have any people over there? Yes, I did. I had all of our family. All of our close family was there. And can you remember, can you give me a guesstimate of, of how many people were there? I'd say 25 to 30 people. And did you receive a call from Ron Gransky at around, sometime around 6.30? Yes, we did. And can you tell the jury just briefly what you were told and what you did? Yes, my husband answered the phone. It was around 6.30 and Ron was on the other line and he told Harvey that they had received a phone call. Objection. Sustained. Yeah, hold on a second. Okay. Let me just, let me go through a little more specific. You got a phone call. Yes. And Ron was saying something, basically, you need to get to the park? Yes. And your, I'm sorry, your, your husband got a phone call. Yes. And did you gather up all the folks that were at your house and head over to the Dry Creek Park area? Yes, we said that. Okay. Go, uh, go ahead. Ron had said that we were needed at the park. All right. And so did pretty much everyone who was over at your house go over to the park? All the adults, yes. The children stayed home. You left the children home alone without a babysitter? How old were they? Were they I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? Did I lose? It just sounded a little strange. You left the children home alone. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, all the adults, yes. All right. And what, where did you go when you got to the park? He left me off. I rode with him and his brother and he left, let me off with Sharon. Well, you missed, I went down by the tennis courts. It's kind of. Oh uh, yeah. That. I went down by the tennis courts. It's kind of on the other, uh, end by the bridge. And where did your husband go? He left, left me off. I rode with him and his brother. And he let me off to be with Sharon. That's where Sharon and Sandy were at the time. And did you meet up with them? Yes, I did. And then your husband went off to search somewhere else? He went off to search, right. And did you see Scott Peterson down in the Dry Creek Park area? Yes, I did. And did you talk to him at all when he was down there? No, I did not. And how would you describe his demeanor, if you, if you can, when you saw him in the Dry Creek area? His back was towards me at first. Mm -hmm. And once he turned around and started walking towards me, he was just walking in a normal stride towards the restrooms. All right. Did you know, I mean, was he screaming out Lacey's name or you know? No. He was kind of looking in the bushes or running around? No. 
And so you say he was just walking towards you, and then did you speak to him there? No. Okay, what's the next thing that happened? The next thing that happened was that after Sharon and Sandy left to go to the house, I stayed in the park to wait for her sister. And did eventually her sister come? No, she had gone to the house, so I was there by myself. All right, so you were there at the park by yourself? Yes. And how long do you think that you stayed down there? I'd say around 15 to 20 minutes. Did you see other people searching the park or in the park when you were down there? Yes, there were other people. Like your family or whatnot? My daughters came, came up over the hill. They had been in the park, and my two daughters came towards me. All right. When they saw me there. How did you get or did you eventually leave the park? Yes, I did. And how did you leave the park and then where did you go? We took Mackenzie with us, the dog, and my daughters, and went to the house on Covina. And what happened next? When you got to Covina, what happened? Well, when I got to Covina, the first thing, of course, I did was go to Sharon. She had already gotten there. And then I went over and I gave Scott a hug. Did he, did you say anything to him at that time? Not at that time. Okay, where was he standing? He was kind of in the middle of the yard by the tree. In the lawn portion or on the driveway? Yes, on the lawn portion. Okay, what, what happened next then? What's the next thing that you remember happening there at Covina? Well, at about that time, other people started arriving and we were just all talking. There was a lot of neighbors coming out and we were just talking about where she could have been. Okay, and at some point, at some time later, did you see Scott standing by his truck in the driveway? Yes, I did. About how much later was it from the time that you had got up from the park to Covina and then you saw Scott standing there? From the park to Covina to the time I went to him mm -hmm. at the truck was about, I'd say, maybe an hour. Okay, and did you talk to him? Yes, I did. And what did you ask him? I asked him where he had been that day. And what did he say? He said he had gone fishing. And did he tell you where? No, I didn't ask. Okay, and did you ask him anything else? I asked him what Lacey was doing that morning when he left. Did, uh, can you tell me as best you can remember exactly the words you asked him and exactly what he said to you that day? I, I said, what was Lacey doing when you left? Okay, and what were his exact words? He said she was watching Martha Stewart. And did you ask him anything else? Yes, I did. What did you ask him? I said, did you talk to her today? And he said, no, I didn't. And did you ask him anything else? No, at that time, no. And did you ask him if he had ever tried to call her? Yes, I did. I stated that if he had talked to her, if he had talked to her, I'm sorry, yes. Okay, well, let's break this down. Did you ask him if he had tried to call her? Yes, I did. And what did he tell you? I said, did you try to call her again? And he said, yes. Okay, and I guess you followed up then with, did you speak to her? I said, did you call her again? Mm-hmm. And he said, yes. Okay, and did you ask him if he had ever spoken to her that day? He, no, I didn't say, have you ever spoken to her today? And what else did you ask him? At that time, nothing. Okay, and then at some time later, did you speak to him again? Yes, I did. About how much later was that? I saw him sitting over on like a little brick wall. It was about 30 minutes later. And during that first conversation, did you ask him anything about Lacey's purse? Not, not the first time. Well, what, was that the second time? Yes. Okay, so when you went over there, you said he was sitting on a little brick wall. Is that right? Mm hmm Yes. About how much later than the first conversation, and I'd say, oh, excuse me, how much later than the first conversation was that? About, I'd say, 30 minutes. And who was sitting with him? 
no one at that time. Okay. And so you just went up to him again? Yes. What did you ask him? I asked him what Lacey was wearing that morning. And okay, are those the exact words that you used? I said, what was Lacey wearing this morning? Okay, and what did he say? He said black pants and a white top. And did he say, describe the top in any more detail? No, he did not. No, okay. Let me show you this report and see if this is correct or this is an error. Do you want to identify it for the record? Yes, I will, Your Honor. It's a report dated May 1st, 2003. And for the record, it's, I mean, for the council, it's 23912. Yes. Oh, wait. Wait. Mm hmm. <laughs> oh, a white long sleeved shirt. Yes, I did say that. All right. So let me go back and then and ask you, as you read that report, does it refresh your memory as exactly how you described it? Ms. Campbell? When... It's okay, Ms. Campbell, take your time. I'm just very nervous. Okay. Very emotional. All right, get your things together. Could you repeat that, please? Yes, all right. So let me go back then and ask you, as you read that report, does that refresh your memory as exactly how you described it? Yeah, he said black pants and a white long sleeved shirt. Okay, and did you ask him anything else? Oh, I'm sorry. Did you ask him anything else about the clothes? I asked him what kind of shoes she was wearing. Okay, and what did he say? He said tennis shoes. Did you ask him if any of those clothing items were there at the house? Yes. What did he say? He said, I don't know. And did you ask him anything about Lacey's purse? I asked him, yes. I asked him if Lacey's purse was there. And what did he say? He said, I don't know. And did you ask him, well, let me ask you this. Are you aware of what the weather was that day? Yes. I mean... It was cold. A normal December day in Modesto. Yes. About how are normal, you know, December days in Modesto? I believe it was like in the 30s. Okay. 40s. And did you ask him anything about Lacey wearing a jacket? Yes, I did. Did she have on a jacket? I'm sorry? Judge? Anna? Mr. Distasio, Mr. Distasio. I know. I, I got to let her finish. I keep jumping ahead. If you keep jumping on her, then the court reporter is going to have a mess. Right. Go ahead. Okay. And give me the exact words that you asked him and the exact words he said back. I said, did she have on a jacket? It was cold. I said, does she have on a jacket? And he said, I don't know. I said, did you see if her jacket was missing? And he said, no. What was his demeanor during the time that you were having these conversations with him? Well, he wouldn't look at me. He just answered the questions, my questions calmly, just matter of fact. Did, had you had, I mean, um, had you known him prior to this night? Yes. I mean, you had seen him at family functions? Yes. Okay, so you were not a stranger to him? No, not at all. Did you see Scott Peterson, or let me just go here. Uh, what time did you leave 523 Covina that at night? Not until around, I'd say, 10, 1030 that night. And did you go back to 523 Covina the next day? Yes, I did. Uh, what time did you get there? Around 8.30 in the morning. And what was going on there at the house? Several people were surrounding the house. There was quite a few inside. When I first got there, I had seen Sharon outside coming around the corner. So I kind of waited for her there. And then I went into the house. And what was, I mean, did you see Scott Peterson? Yes, I did. And what was he doing? He was in the kitchen when I walked in, not really doing anything, 
just standing in the kitchen at that particular time when I walked in. Okay. How long were you uh, there at the house? Till around, until around 1130. And did you see the defendant there at the house the entire time? Yes. That you were there? Pretty much so. I mean, he wasn't in the same rooms I was in, but he was at the house. Okay. And what was he doing? At one time, I saw him talking on the phone in the dining room. And later, it was said that it was his dad that he was talking to. Mm-hmm. He wasn't really doing anything. Okay. And let me, does that pretty much cover what you saw on the 24th and the 25th? Yes. Okay. Let me go back now to a time in November. And do you have a grandson? Yes, I do. And what's his initials? TJ. And was TJ getting any kind of tutoring or anything else, some kind of help from Lacey? I had called Lacey and I asked if she would help TJ with his math. Okay, and how old is TJ? He was 13. He was at that time, he would have been 12. Okay, and this was in November of 2002? Yes. So Lacey was obviously visibly pregnant. Yes. Okay. Do you remember, do you remember the exact date when this happened? No, I don't. Okay. Do you remember if it was in November? Yes, I do. Early November. When you went over to the house, did you see the defendant? Yes, I did. And did you talk to him about anything about, anything about the baby that was coming? Yes, I did. My daughter and I were in, down in the living room where he was and I started talking to him about the name of the baby and was he ready to be a dad, play sports. And what did he say? Well, I'd asked him if I said, are you ready for the football games? And he said, no, I don't play football. And I said, well, then baseball, I said, you'll have to practice on your catching and throwing. My grandsons plays, play basketball, so that was just a common thing to say to him. And he said, no, he, he said, I have friends that can do that. I said, you don't play, you didn't play baseball in school? He said, no. Did you ask him in the context of, are you going to teach the baby to play baseball? I didn't say that. Okay. Did you ask him anything about what he was interested or excited about, you know, teaching the baby anything? I didn't ask him if he was excited. I just said, he better get busy because he's got a job to do. What did he say? He said he had at that particular time. Uh, I thought it was strange because he said, I've got friends to do that. Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay, before you start your cross-examination, I'll give you until tomorrow, Mr. Gergos. Okay, now the cross-examination. So we got the judge again. And, and we have Ms. Campbell is back on the stand and Mr. Gergos, I assume you're ready to go? I am, Your Honor. Go ahead. Thank you. A good morning. Ms. Good Campbell. morning. Okay. Oh, good morning. If, if I understand you correctly, it was about seven o'clock on December 24th and there was a phone call to your house that first alerted you that something was up. I believe it was uh, 6.30. Okay. And what time did you leave the house? Immediately after that. Okay. What time did you arrive at the park? It took us about 10 minutes to get there. Okay, and you had your husband, Harvey. Yes. He drive you. Yes. Okay. And when you got to the park, you, you saw Sharon first. I saw Sharon and Sandy standing out in the middle of the park, yes. Okay. And uh, we've got a map up here that's marked uh, People's 22. Just an overview of the park. Do you remember where you came? Remember where you came into the park? Do you recognize this at all? Yes. All right. you, you can leave. Oh, excuse me. You can leave your chair. Uh, you can stand up and walk over there if you want. It might be better. State what it purports to represent. Uh, the tennis courts are there. Right. That's that's where he let me off. 
right there in front of the tennis courts. Do you remember where Sharon was? Sharon was in the grassy area right there. Okay, uh, you can return to your seat now if you want. As you walked up, let's see, Harvey dropped you off, you got out of the car. Yes. At that point, um, you saw Sharon and Sandy? Yes. And Scott was about 50, 60 yards away from you, from them? I'm not real good at feet, but yes. I'm, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that that pole from where you're seated to that pole is 40 feet. I think it was farther away than that. Um, yes, I would say more like 75 then. Okay. If that's 40, be in this pole that I'm pointing out. Uh-huh. With the picture on it, you're saying about 30? Right. It... Uh, feet past that. Was. Uh, excuse me. Can you let him finish the question <laughs> before you answer? Oh. Thank you. It wasn't me this time. Yeah. And he's back. Uh, Scott's back uh, was to you and to Sharon, correct? Yes. Okay. And now at that point, it's somewhere around 640, 645. Yes, sir. A dark out. Getting dark, yes. A getting dark out. Getting dark. And now the how long were you down in the park? I was down there about 45 minutes. Okay, and Sharon was hysterical at this point. Yes. And Sandy was pretty much... So was everyone. Uh, okay. Was the... Uh, how, how long? Uh, where did you look in the park? I actually I actually didn't look in the park. Okay. What? I wasn't looking at that time. Okay. Well, what did you do? I was standing with Sharon. You standing with Sharon? Yes. Okay, then did you go up to the house? Yes. How did you get to the house? With my daughters. Okay, they drive you? In their car. And when they drive you to the house, how long was it before you gave Scott that hug that you described yesterday? Maybe five minutes. Okay, and then, then how long before you talked to him? Mm, about 30 minutes. And when you talked to him, with the police around? No. Or were there any other people in the immediate vicinity? They were around us, but not right by me, no. Who, who were the other people that were around you? Friends that had come up. There was, I did see a police officer over to my left. I believe Ron was standing in the yard, but no one was standing by me. Okay. Now, the next thing that you did is you went through yesterday. At this, You said that you uh, questioned Scott, correct? Yes. Okay. And then after you questioned him, at some point, uh, you were sent, uh, you know, the police said leave. Is that correct? Excuse me? The police said to leave. No. Everybody was told to leave. No. Did you just leave on your own? No, I didn't leave until late that evening. Well, that's what I mean. At some point, late in the evening, and you were told, or the police, and or everybody just should go home. Well, Detective Ruccini had... Well, but Detective Riccini had was taking Scott to his car, was taking Scott in his car away. So we just left because they said they wanted the park clear. Okay. So when? Uh, what time was that? I think it was around 1030. At night? Yes. And then, then you came back to the Covina house in the morning of Christmas morning. Christmas morning. And the next day, at about what time? About 8.30. Okay, was this Scott home then? Yes, he was. And you stayed there until what time? Around 11.30. Okay, was Scott home all those hours from 11.30, from 8.30 to 11.30? I saw him coming in and out of the house. Okay, did you see him putting up flyers? No. Did you see him with Brent Rocha? I did not see him with Brent Rocha, no. You didn't see him with Brent Rocha? No. How about at 10.30? Was he in the house at 10.30? I couldn't tell you that. Okay. If he was in there, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you that if he was in there at 10.30. And you were, in, and you were there from 8.30 to? 11.30.
11.30, and it's your testimony. Uh, didn't you tell the police that Scott was there? He wasn't doing anything. He wasn't assisting. He was just in the house from 8.30 until 11.30. Isn't that what you told? I told. I said I was there. Detective Grogan? From 8.30 to 11.30. Yeah. And didn't you tell Detective Grogan on Christmas Day from 8.30 until 11.30, Scott was there, he wasn't doing anything? He wants to know if that's what you told Detective Grogan. That he wasn't doing anything? Right. He was an assistant in the search. You thought it was odd. Right. He wasn't outside. He was in and out of the house. Okay. And he, he was an assistant in the search. Mrs. Kempel. I'm having another attack. Oh, okay. You need none of Patty's dog. I, I mean, uh... Therapy dog. Mrs. Ms. Rich Birkert's dog. <laughs> no, he was not. Okay. Now I lost my place, Judge. She wasn't ready. Was And he wasn't assisting him. He, he wasn't putting up flyers? No, he was not. Uh, he wasn't with Brent Rocha, uh, didn't go get taped to go get the flyers? I did not see him leave with Brent. Okay, and, and you're sure of that, right? You're as sure as that as you are about everything else. So sure, this I, one. I did not see him leave with Brent. You're sure he was there in the house? No, I said he was in and out of the house from 8.30 until 11.30, okay. the time I was there. Well, if you if he was in the house and, and out in and out of the house, how, how do you know what, what he was doing outside the house? I don't know what he was doing outside. Well, uh, why didn't you tell the police that uh, you didn't think he was doing? Why did, why did you tell the police that you didn't think he was doing anything? I didn't see him doing anything. Oh. I didn't see him doing anything. What? So, if you didn't see him... Uh, did that mean he didn't do it? I don't know. Okay. Did you tell the police he didn't do anything? I did not. I said I didn't see him doing anything. And you, you didn't see Brent Rocha at all that morning? Sure. I saw Brent. Where did you see Brent? In the house, outside. That uh, this morning, too, between 8.30 and 11.30. Oh, gosh, I don't know what time. I can't say that I know what time I saw Brent. I've got... I was there between 8.30 and 11.30. I've got 23913, which is May 1st report by Grogan. And you, you want to read that report that's yellow highlighted. Uh... Just to yourself. The witness is reading. Does that refresh your memory, your recollection as to what you told the police? Has nothing... Has nothing today with Brent. Does that refresh your recollection as to what you told? Yes. The, the, the police. Did you tell the police that you remained at the house from 9 to 11.30? Yes. And did you tell them that Scott and Sharon were present in the house at that time? Yes. Is that, uh, did you tell them that they, there were other people that came in and out of the house that were part of the search parties? However, Scott never left the house to assist in the search that day. I never saw Scott assist in the search that day. Uh, did you say that uh, he never left the house to assist in the search? I might have had said he never left the house. Okay. Uh, did you say that you felt it was very odd that he was not assisting in the search for his wife when so many others were actively searching in the park? Yes, I said that. Uh, well, how do you know if he left the house? Today you testified he left the house. He was in and out, right? In and out. All right. You never told the police. By leaving the house, I mean the premises. Uh, did you ever tell the police that? Because it didn't make it in that report. That did I tell the police what? That he was in and out. I believe I did. Okay, well, here it says that he never left the house. Isn't that, uh, isn't that what you told the police, that he never left the house? If you recall, Mrs. Kimple, is that what you told the police? Can I say something? 
Yes. That leaving the house, meaning when I say leaving the house, is coming from inside the house, outside the house. From inside the house going outside? Right. Leaving the house. Are you asking if he left in a car? Is that leaving the home? Uh, did you uh, did you watch where he went when he left your eyesight? No. Okay. Did you tell the police that he never left the house? I don't remember saying that. Uh, did you say that he he there were other people assisting in the search, but he wasn't? Did you tell the police that? At that, yes. I he was not in the park. <laughs> okay, and you know that because. Because of other people that were there at the park. Well, were you in the park? That morning, yes. I was in the park also. I thought you were in the house. No, I'm sorry. No, not that morning. I didn't go to the park that morning. No. Let's, uh, oh boy, let's. Why don't we just go reconstruct this, how you came to the police. You didn't go to the police until May 1st. Isn't that correct? Right. So that would have been after Scott was arrested. Yes. And so then, what? All of a sudden, you have an epiphany, you remembered all these details, and... No. Hey, you said, hey, Scott's arrested. I better call the police and, and tell them all this stuff. Well, kind of. Okay. Now, was that after you had already talked to all your girlfriends about what happened? No. Now, had you already talked to Sharon about what happened? I had started thinking about things that I thought were a little unusual, and I mentioned, I mentioned it to Sharon. She goes, don't tell me, tell Grogan. Okay, and did you talk to your husband, Harvey? About? About these, I'm sorry, wait, wait. Mr. Garagos, you're stepping on her answer. Uh, talk to your husband, Harvey, about, about your sudden epiphany of recollection. It wasn't sudden. It was. It wasn't sudden. No. It was some time, two weeks after he got arrested. All of a sudden, you... No, it had been from the beginning. Please don't talk on top of his question. You've got to wait so she can finish the question, and then you can answer. Okay. You, you never called the police up until May 1st, correct? That's correct. Okay, and you never told anybody that uh, you had been in the house from 9 to 11.30 and that Scott they was there, not assisting in the search until May 1st. No one asked me. No one asked you, but you volunteered it. You thought that it would be helpful to the investigation. Yes, I did. And then you were trying to be helpful, right? That's as helpful as you could be uh, when you said that uh, he never left the house and he never assisted in the search, right? Would you say that again? That was, you thought that, uh, that was being helpful. You were making some helpful observations. Yes. Thank you. I have, I have no further questions. May Mrs. Kimple be excused, Mr. DeStazio. That's fine, Stazio. Your Honor. I have no questions. Ms. Kimple, thank you. You are excused. Thank you. Carolyn, I'm here if you need a judge and a court reporter. Okay. Let's see. Next we have uh, Harvey Kemple, who, who's going to do, uh, that's the husband of Gwen. You want to do that one, Nana? Or you want me to? Yeah. Okay. I can do, do it. it. Okay. Let's do Harvey. Wait. Let me find my spot here. There I am. Okay. So this is Harvey. Let we need a judge. Let me okay, Leisha, do you see where the Harvey. judge is? Harvey Kemple. Oh, we have a clerk in here too, a uh, judge and a clerk in here. Let me see. Okay. All right. Okay. Do you want me to be the clerk too? Well, there's a judge and a clerk in the right in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. Next witness, please. Harvey Kemple is the next witness. Harvey Kemple. Okay. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly state under penalty of perjury that the evidence you shall give in the matters now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Be seated. 
State and spell your name for the record. Harvey Thomas Campbell, H-A-R-V-E-Y-K-E-M-P-L-E. Thank you. Mr. DeSasso. Mr. Kempel, do you know Lacey Peterson and the Sharon Rocha family? Yes, I do. How is it that you know them? I was flattered by the article that I was her uncle, but that isn't the case. I'm related through marriage. I'm a cousin. And your wife is Gwen Kempel? Yes, it is. And she is Sharon's cousin? Correct. The had you well, do you live in Modesto? Yes, I do. Live there all my life. How far is it from your house to 523 Covina? Approximately, I would say five and a half, six miles, something like that. And on the 24th, did you receive a phone call from Ron Gransky? Yes, I did. And just basically, what he told you was Lacey's missing. We need you to come down. Can you come down and meet us at the park? Yes, along with a lot of other family members, yes. No, you, no you're incorrect. Oh, correct. Okay, and you took your, yeah, you took, you and your wife went down to the park. Yes, along with a lot of other family members, yes. Okay, and, and can you give me some kind of, just some guesstimate of how many family members you had in your house that day? Well, throughout the day, on and off, there was probably over 45. But at the particular time that he called there, there was probably about 30 to 32 people there in the family. And did you all, did everybody, or, or at least the adults, all go down and start searching the park? Every adult that was there left the home and went to look. And can you just very briefly take us through, you dropped your wife off at the tennis courts. Well, I exited my truck at the at the tennis courts also. Oh, okay. As it worked out, I supplied everybody with flashlights that were that was at the house that I had at the house. We well, happened to enter the at the tennis courts. We happened to enter at the tennis courts because this was where they said when Ron called, he mentioned the tennis courts. Other family members entered from different areas at the at the park. But I exited there with my brother and started hollering Lacey's name and, and looking immediately. All right. So question and answer. Okay. And then you said, so you're at the tennis courts with your brother and other family members kind of going at each end of the uh, park. I found that out later. I didn't realize that that was going to happen. Okay, well you were in the park, where did you search? I searched from the tennis courts west towards, heading towards Lacey's and, Lacey's and Scott's home. Okay, just looking at people's 22 real quickly. Let me lead you through there so the jury knows what we're looking at. You started here at the tennis courts, right? Yes. And then you worked your way west, which would have been down along where this red line is on people's 22. Correct. And you eventually ended up at where the trails head, where the trail leads to where Kavina is. Yes. Okay. And I went beyond that also throughout the evening. Okay. So, and so you also worked your way past the trail entrance. Oh, well, clear down to what I know as La Loma Bridge. Is that the bridge that crosses over the creek? Yes, it is. All right. And when you were down there, did you run into or see other family members? Oh, yeah. Searching, too. We had made phone calls. I would say before 9 o'clock, there were pro approximately of additional family members and friends. There were probably 80 people in the park. Easy. Okay. I'm sorry. The court reporter is uh, heating up her water. Um, oh, that was freaking me out. So, so, I'm sorry. So as you're walking <laughs> down the thing, you're running into people that you recognize? Yes, and we're conversing, talking. Some of us had ran across homeless people, asking questions, seeing other people there that were, that was, 
one gentleman that was a jogger and in fact borrowed my wife's cell phone and called the hospital thinking that because he asked that question immediately. Okay. After how long do you think that you were down in the park area before you went up that trail to Covina? Probably, I'm just guessing, maybe say 35, 35 minutes, something like that. And you, so then did you walk up the trail that leads from down in the park? Yes, I did. Up to Covina? Yes, I did. And can you describe for the jury, how would you describe that trail? Rough, very, very rough. Is it? I had a hard time going up because of the, the boots that I had on were smooth soled. And because of the mud and the rocks and the steepness, I had a hard time getting it up myself. All right. Yeah. And it's, is it a paved trail? No. It's dirt? It, at one time, it looked like it tried to have been asphalted or something, but that had broken up through the years and it was rough rough situation so you got up the trail right yes oh yeah yes and you did did you walk down to 523 covina yes i did and when you were there did you talk to the defendant in this case scott peterson i tried to at first he was on his cell phone at his driveway i approached walking back and forth i stood there didn't really acknowledge me. I didn't really acknowledge him. At that particular time, he was on his cell phone for quite some time. And was there anybody else around him? There was. By that time, there was quite a few people in that just general vicinity of, of family members and friends, yes. Was there anyone, when you say the general vicinity, I guess what I'm saying, Within a few feet, I mean. Okay. We were all from this young lady to myself, I would say. There were quite a few people. Oh, excuse me. Okay. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> we were we were, <laughs> we were all from this young lady to let to myself to myself away. I would say there were quite a few people. What is that? Probably three or four feet? Yeah, four or five feet. Okay, and uh, so, so you say that the defendant was talking on his cell phone? Yes. And and you recognize Scott Peterson as he sits here today in court? Yes, I do. Okay, and then, and, and did you eventually get a chance to talk to him? Yes. What did you ask him? I asked him where she might have gone and what she was wearing. And what did he say? He said he thought she would be taking the dog, Mackenzie, down towards the tennis courts. That's normally where she walked. And that she was wearing black and white the last time he saw her. All right. And did you ask him anything else? At that particular time, I didn't. It was later on that I did. Okay. So let's go through this then. Okay. So at that time, you just asked him, hey, where do you think Lacey went? Right. And he told you that. Right. And then you said, hey, what was she wearing? Yes. And what? Now, let me ask you this. Did it look like when you were interviewed by the police in June, the let me show you something in here about the clothing description that the defendant gave you. And let me ask you if this is correct. Alicia? Alicia? Sorry. Oh my gosh. My dogs just made a mess. Um, um, I lost my spot. Um, uh, you're about, you see, what are you showing? Okay. Um, oh, here we go. What are you, okay. What are you showing? Mr. Discasso? Let's see. It's a report of investigator, Bertolato on June 16th. Uh, okay, hold on a second. Oh. No, that's me. That's Gergo. So I got okay. he, he was just, he was nodding off for a minute. Well, I don't know. It's... 
I love your accent. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> I don't know that this is proper because he said that he needed to have a, his recollection refreshed. Yeah, I was waiting for that to come. He hasn't said he doesn't remember. Oh, that's fine. Um, the It looks like you originally told the police officer that... Objection! That's leading. Sustained. Did... Wait. Do you recall exactly what you told the police as to what Lacey Peterson was wearing, according to the defendant? Do you recall exactly? Black pants and white top. Black pants and white top. Yes. All right. Then, after... All right. After you talked with him there at the house, then where did you go? I, I was around in the immediate, immediate area for just a little while, taking talking to other family members and other friends that had started arriving up towards their home. I went back over to Scott and I asked him where he had been. Bob was Lacey down in the park by herself. Where was he? And when you asked him that, where did this, where did this conversation take place? Right there on the same area as his driveway. Okay, and was anyone around when you asked him that? Again, there were some people around within feet of, of us standing there. Okay, so same same kind of thing. People milling about in the driveway. But was anyone else part of the conversation that you had with him? You know, I couldn't say that for, fact, for a fact. No, I don't know. I really don't. Okay, and what did he, um, where did he tell you that he had been that day? He told me he went to play golf, and I said golf, and I immediately started heading back down to the park to find my brother that had been looking with me. Okay, and at any time that night, did Scott Peterson tell you that he had been fishing that day? I didn't. Hold on. I don't want you to get your memory of exactly, I want you to get your memory of exactly just what he told you, not what someone else might have told you. No, he did not tell me that. Okay, then let me ask you a couple of questions. Have you ever been, prior to that night, have you ever been over to Scott Peterson's house? Yes, I have. At 523 Kavina? Yes, I have. And did you have any contact with their dog, Mackenzie? Contact? Yeah, I mean, yes. What I mean... The dog was in the backyard and so on, yes. Right. And when you were there, did you see the dog? Yes, I did. When And we've heard it described as just kind of, you know, a big, playful kind of golden retriever dog. Yes. That's right. Oops, hold on a second. That's, yeah, a good description, yes. Okay. That was the dog in, in, did you observe anything about the dog, about the dog being protective of the home or anything like that? The, oh, sure. Uh, can you describe that for us? Mackenzie was very, very protective. The last time that I had an incident to be actually at Scott and Lacey's house was July 4th. We had gone there for a barbecue. They had just had their pool finish and they had a barbecue at their house. I was carrying in some various things, coats, ice chests, and so on. Mackenzie, each time I came up to the gate, was a protective dog. He growled and barked and, until Lacey said it's okay. Then he backed up and would allow me to come in through. Come in through. They have like a picket gate there, so to speak. And everything was fine once I got in there. But Mackenzie was a protective dog just like so many other people have. Okay. Now, did, after the 24th, and, and we've heard basically that at some point, everybody went home that night. It was after the police department said that we, they were going to scour the park with the dogs in the helicopter. They wanted everyone out because we ran across approximately a dozen homeless people and were questioning them. And so they want, They said that they wanted to question them. Okay. And so then, 
did you all, or at least did you and your wife go back to your house? No, we went back to Lacey and, and Scott's home. Okay. And then eventually I, I left. It got into the later hours, and yes, I went back home. My wife went over to Sharon and Ron's. And uh, let's see, the next day, and just over the next couple of days, were you aware when the Volunteer Center got set up at the Red Lion Hotel? Yes. And you were involved at all in going on, you were involved, excuse me, were you involved at all in going out and searching areas that they were trying to look for Lacey? For many, many days at the very, very beginning, just day in and day out. What do you think, when do you think you first started searching? The very, the first very day that it was, we searched Christmas morning. We, and I mean this by family members that were still at my residence, the very next morning, after the police department had more or less said that they had looked had looked through the park, we went back over and looked at areas that we thought might have might be suspicious looking in the creek area. I was born and raised in that town, traveled that creek many, many times, and thought that there were there might be some areas that she possibly could have slipped into or whatever. Okay. So I went back. Okay, and when you're talking about the creek? Dry Creek. You're talking about the Dry Creek area? Correct. And did you, over the course of any other days, search other areas? Oh yes, yes. Can you just give me, I mean, you don't need to list every single one. Can you give us some idea of what you did? I covered the Crow's, the Crow's Landing area, which is towards the west side. Paradise area, which is the west side, northerly up McHenry Avenue. I don't think there wasn't, I don't think there wasn't a direction that I didn't take some of my own, own children with me and the other, and other family members, and even by myself, and look in every direction that I could think of. How long did you personally or, or recruit other family members to do like kind of this search throughout Stanislaus County? Up until the day she was found. So you continued searching off and on until she was found? Yes. And while you were at the Volunteer Center, did you did you see the defendant, Scott Peterson? Yes, I did. And can you tell the jury when would you generally see him there at the Volunteer Center? Mainly early in the morning. I'm an early riser just because of the business that I'm in. And I usually arrive there early to pick up more flyers. And that's when I would see Scott. And what, just so the jury knows a kind of a little bit about you, what kind of business are you in? I'm in construction. Okay. So we get up early. Right. Construction workers generally, you know, it's early and kind of ends early. Right. Yes. All right. What so you said you would see Scott Peterson there in the morning? Yes. And did you ever have an occasion where did you ever try to figure out the best way to phrase this? Uh, but did you ever go with Scott Peterson and hang up flyers or anything like that? No, throughout the whole time, normally we would, a lot of us would see one another on a day to day basis of looking and see one another putting up flyers. I had never seen Scott out putting up flyers, but that one morning I asked him, which direction are you heading? And. Okay. And let me stop you there for a second. So at some point during this time that you were at the volunteer center, you did, you speak to the defendant. Yes. Say, Hey, and he told you that he was going to hang flyers. Yes. And did you say to him, Oh, okay. Where are you going? Yeah, I asked him what direction he thought he was going to be hanging flyers. And what time of the morning was this? Oh, this no. was about... What time, oh, sorry. what time of the morning was this? This was about, I'm guessing, 9 o'clock, say... 9 o'clock. Yeah, eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock. Go ahead. 
And what happened then during that time? Did you, what did you do? Well, I thought maybe I would see him in, in that general vicinity sometime that day. And so I left. He left. I left. It just so happened that as I, I was leaving the parking lot in my pickup, I saw Scott and I I have to I to have assume it was either his father's pickup or his brother's pickup. It was very similar to his own, but I don't know whose it was for certain. Okay. So you saw him in some pickup. Right. And you did recognize that it was him. Oh, yeah. And right, yeah. Uh, what happened next then? He turned. He went out of the Red Lion Inn and said he was going to the Paradise Road area, which I know is in West Modesto. From leaving the Red Lion, he would have to turn left turn left to, to get in that, in that direction. It just so happened when I saw him leaving, he turned right. And I thought that was a little peculiar, but I didn't pay much, too much attention to it. And in that way, I went the same direction thinking, well, gee, I was going to catch up with him and tell him it's back over in the other area. But as it was, I was a few cars behind him. And did you follow him? Yes, I did. Where did he go? To the mall in Modesto, which is located on Sisk Avenue, and turned into the mall. And when he turned into the mall, did you see him hang up any flyers? No, I mean, that was early in the morning. The mall wasn't even open, and he just pulled into the parking lot. Did you pull up next to him or talk to him? No, I didn't. Don't ask me why I didn't. I don't know why. I thought it was strange that he was there, so I just pulled over to the side and and watched, thinking he was going to meet up with somebody else. Maybe maybe they were going to canvas the whole mall area. I didn't know at that time. I wasn't thinking about that. And how long did you sit there in the parking lot just watching him, I guess? 40, 45 minutes. He sat, he sit, sit, he sat there, and I sat there. And then what happened next? I left. At the times you were there, did you see him ever get out of his car? No, I wasn't that close. I was back a little ways. Okay. Sorry, we have a flying squirrel in the courtroom. Okay. Everything's good with the squirrel? Okay, good. <laughs> Squirrel um, in the courtroom. <laughs> yes. Order in the courtroom. No slang squirrels allowed. Okay. okay. Um, at the times you were there, did you see him ever get out of his car? You said no. Okay. So uh, was there other, was there other, another occasion? Uh, what month was all this taking place? This was the command center. It was set up almost immediately. So this was the very beginning of January. And was there ever another occasion when you asked the defendant about where he was going to hang up flyers? Well, and can I say why I... Well, you just have to answer the question. If he wants to know why, he'll ask you. Well, yeah. Why don't you just tell us why this was all going on? Well, because if you had asked me earlier about him... When he said he went to play golf, I had learned after that, that same evening. Objection. Non-responsive. False for hearsay. Well, it's not. What was the question again? Uh, why? Uh, what did you... Because I was suspicious. Objection. Yeah. Uh, hold on a second. Hold on. Objection. Non-responsive. Wait, I, I have haven't... a motion to strike. I haven't heard the question I yet. I want to strike that answer. <laughs> the part of the answer can go out. The jury will disregard. Yes. What is the question? Why? Why were you questioning the defendant about where he was going to hang up the flyers? And why did you follow him on one of these occasions? When he told me he went to play golf, I learned from my wife that same evening 
while I was still looking in the park for Lacey that he told my wife that he went fishing. Okay, one second. I, guess I... I know, I'm trying. And. Oh, I got it. And? Oh. And? <laughs> oh, so I was very suspicious the very first night. That's why I followed him to the mall. And I hung back a little bit to see what the heck was happening. You're talking about this first time in January? Correct. Okay. All right. And then the second, did you, was there another time when you asked him where he was going to hang the flyers up and you followed him again? No, I became suspicious that first time. Objection. Non-responsive. Yeah. You have to answer the question, Mr. Kempel, or else we're going to get these objections. You want to ask the question again? Right. Um, so go ahead. You became suspicious the first night? Correct. And then you, you followed him the first time? Yes. And he didn't go where he told you? Correct. And then, so you were still suspicious? Correct. Lisha? Oh, now what's the question? Okay. So what then? What's the next thing that happened about whether you with him hanging up the flyers and you followed him? I followed him from the command center when he rented a car after they had impounded his truck. I followed him and he went to a golf course in northern Modesto. Okay, and did you had you previously asked the defendant where he was going to go that day? No, I hadn't. I just followed him from the command center. And then he went uh, to a golf course. And what time of day was that? That was very early morning in the morning. I'm guessing again at about 9, 9.30. And what was the name of the golf course? Del Rio Golf Course. Okay. And did you see him pull into the course? I saw him pull into the parking lot and I kept going. Okay. Nothing further, Your Honor. Cross-examination by Pat Harris. Okay. Mr. Harris, go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Kempel. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry I forgot what we were here. Good morning, Mr. Kempel. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, right. I understand your testimony. You stated that you, uh, when you was when you were standing there in the driveway, you asked Scott uh, where he was going that day, what he was doing that day, and, and he said he had been golfing. Is that correct? Correct. And you said at uh, that point uh, you left to go tell Mr. Ron Gransky. You went to go tell Mr. Ron Gransky down in the park. No, I left. I left that area to go find my brother that was down in the park looking still. I'm sorry. Uh, who who was your brother? Bob Kempel. All right. Yes. And when you left the area at that time, did you mention to anybody at all that Scott had told you that he had just gone golfing? I mentioned it to my brother. You you told your brother? Yes, when I went back down in the park. Okay, at any point in time, did you mention it? And I understand from your testimony is that you were at the volunteer center pretty early that day, much early every day. Oh, you bet. And you were determined that you were going to help find the Lacey. You betcha. And uh, you were around, gosh, uh, I guess at the volunteer center, hundreds of people at the volunteer center over the course of the first three weeks or so. Thousands. Thousands over the course of the first three, four weeks that the volunteer center was open and, and you helped organize and you helped work with these thousands of people. I helped pass out flyers and organize some of my family members, yes. And you were very close with the Rocha family. Very much so. You spent a lot of time talking with uh, Ron and Sharon and some others, I assume. Oh, and on and off, yes. Yes, by all means. And I would assume other family members, Brent to Rose, you were talking to. Oh, sure, sure. At any point during any of this time, did you ever mention to any single person that Scott Peterson told you that he had been golfing that day? Oh, by all means. So you told all of them? I told my brother. I told my daughters. This was after my daughter's had told me that he was at work. You told everybody you could think of that Scott Peterson had been golfing that day. 
You're darn right I did. Absolutely. So the first time the police contacted you in June, about six months, excuse me, a little over six months after Lacey has disappeared, is that correct? Sometime, yeah. I had I had spoken to other officers even even that evening. You spoke to other officers? Correct. And that evening what they that we were in the park area. And did you ever tell any officer that evening that uh Scott had told you he'd been golfing? I don't believe so, no. No, you didn't, did you? No. No, you told numerous, well, let me just ask you. How many people do you think you had told that Scott went, go that Scott went golfing? Well, it probably quite a few. Dozens. Dozens? Easy, easy. Dozens, easy. Easy. And the police showed up to interview you in June. Six and a half months later, they showed up to interview you for the first time. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And when they showed up to interview you, they didn't show up to interview you to ask you a question about the golfing, did they? Hold on. I don't know if I understood you correctly. No, that was poorly, poorly phrased. Uh, if I'd... When they showed up to interview you, the question that they asked you, the reason they came to interview you was because they had a comment that they had overheard from someone that uh, you had a problem with Scott over some barbecued chicken, correct? No, 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 no. No, that was an issue that I brought up because I was so god darn mad that the man went to play golf when his wife was pregnant. And I saw more reaction out of him when he burnt the damn chicken than when his wife was missing. And that's exactly right. You're darn right. And that's when you told the police officer. You're darn right, I did. Absolutely. And you told all these people that he had been golfing. And then, the, by God, he didn't even show any emotion. But then he showed, uh, he showed more emotion on that barbecue chicken. No more emotion than he's showing right now. Absolutely. Every single person you told about this golfing, every single person that you knew, you told Scott. Scott Peterson told you that night that he had been golfing. Well, in the immediate area, yes. And not? Yes. Not a single one of them told the police that, did they? I don't know, sir, whether anyone else repeated what I... Not one police... Alicia? Alicia? Shoot, I was muted. Wait, wait, wait. You've got to let him finish his answer. Yes, I... Uh... Not one police officer came to your house at any point for six and a half months to ask you if, in fact, Scott Peterson. There was no reason no. for. Objection, Your Honor. It's been asked and answered, and it's argumentative. Yeah, it's argumentative. It's been asked and answered. I'll sustain that. Now, you, Mr. Harris, you're going to have to wait until this gentleman finishes his answer. Mr. Temple? You've got to wait until the lawyer finishes his question because she can't report two people talking at the same time. Yes, I'm sorry. That's all right. I understand. Go ahead. In fact, uh, when the police officer came and interviewed you, you he didn't even ask you. Uh, he didn't even ask you the specific question had, uh, in fact, you told other people that Scott Peterson had been golfing, did he? I don't know if I really understand that. Oh. I'll rephrase it. What you're trying to ask me? Rephrase it. I'll rephrase it. Uh, you had to volunteer to the investigator that day. You had to volunteer that Scott Peterson was golfing that day, didn't you? That that wasn't the issue. That's not my question. The issue was... Wait, you can answer his question yes or no. Then you can explain your answer. Uh, you had to volunteer the information to the investigator that that day Scott Peterson told you that night Scott Peterson told you that he had been golfing. No. And you can explain your answer. The whole reason that the officer got a hold of me was in talking to the other officers at the very few days 
onset of this is that is that what what did I recognize about Scott or the situation that night? What did I what did I see in the park? Did I see anything in the park that was the whole thing? And and then everything of what I saw, what I felt came out in my statement. The judge had a little laugh. You're on mute, Caroline. I had a little mic accident. I mean, I had a little uh, seltzer accident. Um, uh -oh. Hang on, let me just grab a towel. Everybody can take a, a five-second recess. Okay. Right Re recess in the court. Oh my Flying monkey seltzer. Hi, Scoot. Hey, Lisha. Hi, Nan Hi, Nana Patty. How are you feeling? Hi, Lisa. I'm doing okay. Okay. How are you? You were... You were so tired last night. You were so <laughs> smooth. And then your pup came up on your lap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's his, his or her name? That was Willie. That's oh, Willie. Yeah. He's sweet. Thank oh. you. He's a big mama's baby. I could tell. Mm-hmm. I love it. Mm-hmm. I mm -hmm. love animals so much. I couldn't make it through COVID without my two babies. I couldn't make it through any of this. Oh, mm -hmm. I just love my dog so much. I know. There's a reason to keep going. Yeah, and I don't have kids or grandkids, so mm -hmm. they're it. <laughs> That's your babies. They are, and they. I uh, just hired a new dog walker and... She's been here about a month, and she's helping, and it's it's so awesome. It's great. That's, that is great. Yeah. <clears throat> well, almost, Carolyn spelled her yeah, we're almost, just, yeah, we're almost uh, almost cleaned up. Okay. Just, just take clean, your time. On my keyboard, at least. Just, you have a right. um, uh, um, microwave right by your right there on your desk. No. That oh, you don't? Me. Because it Leisha. sounded like you do. That was Leisha. Oh, I have I have a toaster oh, oven. Oh, I'm oh, making oh. my one of my gluten free um <laughs> uh, English muffins. Oh, I'm sorry. okay. I just cut a piece of aluminum <laughs> foil, so right. I'm hungry. I eat at night. Like this is when I'm like, yeah, like all day I'm sick on my meds, and then now is when I'm able to eat. So okay. I, I think shove it in my face. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, you put you get it when you can because okay. otherwise I look like Skeletor. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay. All set? Yeah, we're all set. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Where sorry. were we? I knew we weren't Let's supposed see. to. We were supposed to not have glasses on the uh, tables here, but sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, it happens. It happens. I mean, I've never seen you do that before, so that and if that's like what two plus years or something. Yeah, I don't I know. know. Oh. Okay, uh, let me just get my place now. Um, Harris, have you have you take a look at a report? Okay, let's see now. DA investigator okay. Kevin Bertello Lotto. Okay, can you phrase it? You have a volunteer. Okay. Oh, it. Oh, it Harris. Did you say? Oh, okay. Did the judge say read it to yourself yet? No, okay. no, right about that. Okay. Have you, uh, take a look at a report. Oh, excuse me. I'm a parrot. I forgot. <laughs> They're all going to have it. Have you take a look at the report. Uh, this is a report, the DA investigator, Kevin, uh, Bertolato. Uh, it's from the report. I'm sorry. My eyesight is bad. Uh, this report is, is one. Thank you. Uh, Hand me your glasses. Thank you for your glasses. I like that. Okay. Uh, 21679. Thank you. The report. If you would read this paragraph, the one. Read, read it to yourself. Read it to yourself. Just read it to yourself. Kemple's reading. How, how does, does that refresh your recollection? Well, that was part of it, yes, yeah. 
uh, the reason uh, that inspector, excuse me, uh, investigator Burlato came to your house was because he had heard that you had made these expressions. You had made the statement that Scott was more upset over the burnt chicken than he was over the disappearance of Lacey. He wasn't at my home. We talked over the phone. He set up an interview that was close to my job site. Okay. And yes, he heard heard that statement and wanted to know what my feelings were. And that's why he interviewed you. And yes, and that. Thank you. Culminated. Uh, thank you. The whole... Now let's talk a little bit about this night of December 24th. It's my understanding you received a phone call around 6 o'clock, 6.30 from Ron Gransky. About 6.15, 6.30, something. And you got in your car and you went to the park. Correct. And if you could just kind of walk me through that timeline a little bit about what your memory is, the timeline. How long were you actually in the park? Until the Modesto Police Department asked us to leave, which is approximately 10 o'clock. Okay. And you were back there the entire time in the park? On and off, back and forth from the Covina address. Okay. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to kind of take it in bits and pieces here. Sure. And if you would, you were in the park for that first time. Is 6.45 to about what? I would say we probably got there about 6.35, something like that. Okay. Until approximately another 35 minutes. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's Okay. Until approximately another 35 minutes, 7 o'clock, or something like that, that I went up to Scott and Lacey's house. And when you got back to his house, I believe you told the police that Scott was there. Correct. And when you went up to his house, in your memory of that evening, uh, it was about 7 o'clock, Scott was there, and he was uh, waiting at the house, correct? He was on his driveway. He was on his driveway approach, yes. And the police was, they were not there yet. I believe maybe a black and white had just arrived when I got there. Okay. Now, whether he had been in the area, I don't know. Well, uh, did you tell that investigator that, in fact, you were present when they first showed up? When I... The Modesto police person. When I first saw that black and white drive up, yes. Okay. And did you, in fact, tell the police that Scott seemed uneasy about uh, the police yeah. getting there? No, no, that was later on that, that he seemed uneasy. Okay, and did you tell them that, in fact, Scott seemed uneasy and didn't seem comfortable with the police officers going into the house? Correct. Okay, so basically you were saying that in your mind, Scott didn't want the police officers in his house. Correct. And then you could tell this how? Just by when other people and myself were trying to talk to him, every time an officer made a move towards the house, because there was, was other people asking it questions. Uh huh. He seemed more intent on going over to the house rather than trying to answer anyone's questions. He was more intent on getting into that house rather than actually talking to the people. Correct. There were a lot of people asking Scott at what at that particular time, where would she have possibly gone? Again, more on what she was wearing there was a lot of family members and friends there at that particular time but that time by that time absolutely and a lot of people were constantly coming up to scott peterson asking him over and over these questions correct oh i would to somewhat say yes you're you're right the same questions correct oh sure sure absolutely what was she wearing and by all means. Where had she been? Where would she might where would she might have gone? Okay, and Scott seemed more intent on actually trying to go into that house and see if he could help those police. No, no, no. 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 He didn't he didn't want them going back he didn't want them going in the house. He didn't want them going in the house. No. That's what he it seemed that's what it seemed like to me. I say it it seemed like that to me. And you specifically recall when the police got there that in fact they asked Scott if he could go into the house. If they could go into the house. 
I don't know if that transpired or not. I really don't. Now you saw them going up and talking to Scott Peterson, right? Yes, I did. And then you saw the police then walking right into the house, didn't you? I saw them going into the yard. I didn't did not see them going into the house. You saw them going into the yard? Yes. You never saw the police going in the house? No, I did not. The entire time you were there, you never saw the police going in the house? You have to understand, I was back and forth from the park at this time, too. I was still looking. Okay, okay. We'll get to that. You, in fact, told the police that the officers would go, they would go into his residence, and he would follow the officers into the residence, and that he seemed very concerned about them being in the house. Do you recall that? Well, that's my spot. When I saw that, that was into his yard that I was referring to, into his front gate, if you're familiar with his home. Yes. So you saw them going into the yard as opposed to the residence. Correct. So the officers wrote that. They were just incorrect in the way they wrote it down. Well, they may have misunderstood what I was referring to as the front gate, which is if you have seen the residence, it looks like part of the home. I mean, their front gate, it's just the way the house is designed. Okay. In fact... Uh, what you later said was that you felt that Scott, the entire time the police were there, that Scott didn't want the police in the house. You have to understand my feelings at that particular time. I wouldn't have cared whatever the police wanted to do. I would not have left. Objection. It's not responsive. It's his state of mind. It isn't relative. It's his state it's of mind. His... It's relevant. That's what the question called for, Your Honor. I think so. So you can finish your answer. When myself, and I'll speak for myself then, was asking Scott questions, why would he leave my situation of asking a question about his wife and her whereabouts? Just leave in the middle of it. When an officer was going towards his home, what he showed, no concern, none whatsoever. Right. In fact, uh, you said in your direct statement to the police that Scott should have turned to have allowed them in, you should have talked to them, and he should have turned. You're darn right. The house inside out. You're darn right. The truck, the warehouse. Whatever it took. And the whole bit. Excuse me. You've got to wait until he finishes his question. He should have had them look, he should have let them look in the house, look in the truck, go to the warehouse, whatever. He should have let you them bet. do anything they wanted to do. You betcha. And are you, were you aware, in fact, that he let them in the house that night, and he let them look in the truck that night, and he took them to the warehouse personally? He didn't do that while I was there. He didn't do that while you were there? No, not that, not that I know of. You saw the police walking into the residence. I saw the police go in through the gate. Oh, he already said he saw the police walking through the gate, not the residence. We're beating a dead horse here. He saw them walk through the gate. Through the gate. Next question. One of the officers wouldn't not go back, go into the back because of McKenzie and ask me if the dog is aggressive. I said no. It is not aggressive. Protective, you bet. Aggressive, no. Absolutely. And uh, were you there when Detective Brocini, uh, you were there uh, off and on during the night? Yes, I was. Uh, were you there when Detective Brocini sat there with Scott and went through the truck? I couldn't have told you what Detective's name was. They were there at that particular time. At that time... I could have cared less if his name was Taylor. If he was looking, that's all I was concerned about. Uh, did you see any detectives or any police officer at the time standing with Scott Peterson as he searched the truck? As he started the truck? As the... No. Police officers searched the truck? No, I was not. You weren't there for that? 
No. Okay, and you weren't aware that at some point Scott Peterson was taken away by a police officer that night, correct? I learned about that. You did learn about that? Yes. And did you also learn that when Scott Peterson took them to took them was the warehouse that night? No, I didn't find out didn't find that out until later. Okay, so based on the statements you gave the police that you thought uh, his actions were incorrect or his actions were upsetting you, concerning to you, based on the fact that he wouldn't cooperate by letting them in the house, the truck, and the warehouse that night, does that change your opinion of what exactly Scott Peterson did that night? You, you have to understand that... I'm not asking. Wasn't just my opinion. No, the question is, would that change your opinion, Mr. Temple? Would it change my opinion? No, no, he, in fact, did. Wait, let him finish his answer. Would it change your opinion if you knew that Scott Peterson had given the police permission to go into his residence, took them to the warehouse, and let them search his truck? Would that change your opinion about his conduct that night? That's the question. No. Would it change my opinion? Yes. Question. Yes. Today. Now that you know all this. Not with the other things I know. No. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) It wouldn't because the other things you know. May I ask the question? Yes. The other things you know is that on January 15th, it was released that Amber Fry and the defendant were having an affair, correct? Yes, it was. And at that point, regardless of what you hear, from that point on, it will never change your opinion, will it? There's uh, there's a lot of things. I didn't ask that. That may. Mr. Temple, you've got to just answer the question. I know you want to get this off your chest, but you've got to do this legally. And if you keep volunteering, we'll be here all day. You've just got to answer the question. What was the question again? You want to read it back? That's the question. Would it ever change your opinion about his conduct? Personally, I I didn't care whether Scott had an affair or not. So that doesn't change my opinion of what I was feeling that night. Okay. And feeling now. Well, you stated that, in fact, at one point you approached Scott Peterson. Do you remember telling the investigator that you approached Scott Peterson and you told him that between 85 and 90 people were out searching for Lacey? You betcha. And do you recall making that statement? You betcha. And do you recall stating that Scott seemed to be taken aback by that information? You betcha he was. Go to the go go the doe in the headlight stare. He seemed to be. He gave me the doe in the headlight stare. He seemed to be taken aback. You betcha he was. Now I'm sorry. Uh, will you let me finish the question, please? I'm sorry. Uh, he seemed to be surprised. Yes, he was. And you then told the investigator that in retrospect, looking back, you believe that was the reason he was surprised was that Scott felt that he had gotten more attention than he planned. I may have said that. Is that what you told the police? I may have said that. And that was in retrospect afterwards, you didn't believe that that, you didn't believe it that night. I believe he was surprised that night. Yes, I do. Absolutely, he was surprised that there were many people who cared and that that there there were many... You say yes. Oh, yes. Sorry. Turned out for his wife. You betcha. Absolutely. Now let's let's discuss the the uh, well. Let let me finish on the timeline. I'm sorry I interrupted. You said uh, you come back to the house uh, around seven o'clock, something like that. Yeah. How long did you? The first time. Hang around the house. Do you have any recollection? The first time I came back. The first time you came back. I'm going to say twenty twenty five minutes, probably after he told me. He played golf. Uh, the first time I asked him, he told me 
what she was wearing. That was my first question. And then a few minutes afterwards is when I, I was able to get his attention again. And then that's when he told me he went to play golf. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay. I just go ahead and read hers. <laughs> okay. Well, when you say you get his attention, uh, didn't you tell the police that, in fact, what happened was that you walked up to Scott Peterson and you started asking him questions while he was on his cell phone? I tried to get his attention. I didn't ask him a question while he was on his cell phone. And he was pacing back and forth and wasn't really acknowledging me. I want to refer you back to the report by Investigator Bertolato. If, if you'll just read this section silently. Uh, does that refresh your recollection? Basically what I'm saying. Well, well, let me, let's see what you told the investigator, okay? You told the investigator that, in fact, you didn't tell him that Scott was pacing up and down, now, did you? I may have said pacing, and he may have taken it another way. He was walking back and forth. I don't know if you want to characterize it as a pace, he was walking back and forth on the approach of his driveway. Well, uh, but you, in fact, uh, let's go over what you told the investigator. You told the investigator you walked up and you found Scott standing in the driveway talking on his cell phone. Correct. And you told him that you asked him where late he was and he said uh, he, he didn't answer and he continued to talk on the phone. Correct. Uh, so he was, in fact, on the phone when you were talking to him. Correct. And you continued to talk to him. You continued to ask him. You asked Scott Peterson what she was wearing. And once again, he didn't respond to the question, but in fact, continued to talk on the phone. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. it all yes. went into four or five times. No, you're right. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yes. And, and in fact, you asked him a third question and he continued to talk on the phone. I don't know if it went into four or five times where... So all... It may have been four or five times. So all these questions you were asking him that he's not responding to. He's talking on his cell phone at the time. Yeah, I'm not asking him that, that question every time. That wasn't my intent when I made that statement. I was saying, Scott, Scott, he was walking. I asked him one time after he hung up from the phone what Lacey was wearing, so my brother and I possibly could see some type of clothing or whatever that might alert us down down in the park. That was my main reason for going up there. But that's not what you told the officers. Well, I mean, that's what I was, I'm telling you now, my, why the question was put to him, what was she wearing? Right, that's what you're telling us today. Yes. It's not what you told the officer during the interview, though, is it? Um, it's there. Yeah. In fact, it's there that you continued all these questions you asked Scott that he refused to respond to. He was on the cell phone at the time talking, and that's what you told the officer, wasn't it? He was on his cell phone. Yes, sir, he was. Yeah. Okay. Now you say you stayed there about 20, 30 minutes, something like that. Something like that, yeah. And during that time, there was a lot of commotion. There was a lot of people wandering around. Fair statement. And you went back to the park and, and then and began looking the search. Right. Yeah, you mentioned that you're very familiar with this park. Very familiar. I got a little confused. I get a little confused. You, you got to forgive me because I get confused with the names of uh, East Loma versus uh, Dry Creek Park. The area you're searching in is actually Dry Creek Park. It's been named many things over the years. I know it is as Dry Creek Park. So that may be part of my confusion. It's the same area called by different names. Correct. So when I refer to Dry Creek Park, we're referring to the same area. If you look at the map, could you please point out on that area, out the area we're referring to, if you if you could point. You can show him, Mr. Temple. Do you recognize where the tennis courts are up there? Yes, actually, it extends past that to El Vista, or Old Oakdale Road, clear down to La Loma, which is way further south down, further down. 
That whole Dry Creek area was known as Dry Creek Park. All right, so that, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Judge. All right, so that? The entire area. The whole entire area. Now they have broken it up and named it different sections and various city council people and different. <laughs> and, uh, you. Normal propaganda. They have a habit of doing that. The area you, you had, I guess uh, you spent a number of years. Been there all my life. I've been there all your life. You knew it very well. You mentioned that night that you, while you were searching, one of the things that you did was that uh, there was a number of homeless people in the park, and you, you talked to them. Yes, there was. We ran across, through other relatives looking, we probably ran across about a dozen. Yeah, and that's not uncommon in that park. No, not real, not real uncommon. No, not in today's age. And you went back to the park, and how, how long did you search for Approximately, I would say about another 45 minutes or so, and then I returned back up to the Lacey and Scott's home. Okay, so this is a second trip back to up the house. Is that, would that be right? Uh-huh. And on your second trip back up to the house, did you, did you talk to Scott at that point in time? No, nope, nope, I did not talk to him. Well, well, if we had helped me with this time here, if you had gotten back to the house and you think around 7 o'clock and you were there for approximately 30, 25, 30 minutes, that would be about 7.30. You went back to the park for another 45 minutes, you think it was? Thereabouts, yes. So it would be about uh, 8.15. Would that seem? Somewhere in that neighborhood, yes. And at about 8.15, you went back to the house? I went back to the house, yes. And then the second time you went back, uh, you didn't actually talk to Scott? Nope. And did you see Scott at that point? Yes. Okay. And was Scott going into the house, going in and out of the house, or was he just standing out in the yard at that point? At that particular time, he was just out in the yard. And do you recall being telling the investigator that, in fact, Scott should have been out looking, that he should have been out, but less worried about the, being at the house, and he should have been out looking? Mm -hmm. Hold on a second. I lost my place again. Hard for me. In your opinion. Yeah, in my opinion, yes. And and were you aware that, uh, in fact, Scott had been ordered to stay at the house by the police? I wasn't aware of any such order. Were you, in fact, aware that Scott had been trying to go out, passing out flyers in the neighborhood that night, and he had been told, he had been told to stay at that house? Hard for me to believe. That's hard for you to believe. Yes. You don't believe the police would have told him that he couldn't leave the area. I don't care whether they would have told him, told me or not. I would have been there. You would. So whatever the police say, it doesn't matter. You would have gone off anyway. If it was my wife, yes. So you wouldn't have. You wouldn't have thought the police know best about how to find your wife, right? You would have done what you thought was best. Fair statement. Okay, the volunteer center trips, where you, you said that uh, you had talked to Scott one morning, if I, if I understand your testimony, and, and Scott had said that uh, he was going to put up flyers at, uh, a, is it uh, Paradise Road? Paradise Road area, which is West Modesto. And when he came out of, uh, which, what made you suspicious, is when he came out of the area of the community center, you said he went in the wrong direction to the Paradise Road. I was already suspicious before that. Well, what made you suspicious that day? I'll rephrase it. What made you suspicious that day is that he went out in the opposite direction. Correct. Now, have you planned on following him that day? No. So you made the decision, you decided to follow him that day because uh, he went in the wrong direction. Yeah, correct. And it, it's your testimony that you thought it was strange that a man, a man who just lost his wife, uh, who would want to go somewhere uh, sit quiet, to just sit, that you thought it was odd. No, I didn't. That wasn't even in my mind. No, it wasn't, was it? No. Now you thought his behavior was odd, though, to do it. Fair statement. And did you think your behavior, 
following a grown man around, sitting in a parking lot for 45 minutes and staring at him was odd? Objection. It's argumentative. Leisha? Sustained. Sustained. Fair statement. Okay. Fair statement. Sorry. Um, the answer can stand. Ha ha ha. Did, what are we laughing at? <laughs> I did believe it was odd. In fact, uh, you told the police that you were there about an hour and a half. No, it was, that was wrong. That was wrong when you told? He must have. I corrected that statement when I read it. Uh, you did tell him that, in fact. Yeah. You weren't there for an hour and a half. No, it was about 45 minutes. And while you were there, Scott just kind of sat in his car, mostly from what you could see. You know, I was far enough. I couldn't tell you whether he was moving or or, or what. All right. You testified that, or excuse me, I'm sorry. Now, you told the investigator that you had followed Scott to the country club, the Del Rio Country Club. Is that correct? Yes. And, and you told them that you knew he was a golfer. Yes. And that, in fact, you had friends at the Del Rio Country Club. You had these friends that you actually called uh, you, and then they called you, and they told you that Scott had been showing up at the country club. Is that correct? Yes. No. No, I'm sorry. No one specifically <laughs> called me. It was in person that I had heard it. Okay. Now, did you give the names of these friends to, to, to the investigators so they could follow up? I wasn't asked. You weren't asked the question? No. The investigators never bothered to, father, to find out whether or not you could back up the story. Objection. It's argumentative. I wasn't asked. It's so small. This is so small. The answer can go out to say next question. Uh, could you tell us uh, who these friends are? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry? Yes, I could. Okay, could you please give us the names? <laughs> Dennis. <laughs> this guy's a character, man. Yes, he is. Dennis <laughs> Tobin. Dennis Tobin, for one. I'm sorry. What was that name? Dennis Tobin. Hogan? Tobin. T-O-B-I-N. And who else? I'm trying to think. I can't think of a last name right off the top of my head, but a young lady by the name of Stephanie that works at the golf course. And you don't, uh, you, you just know Stephanie. Do you, do you know? I can't think. I'm sorry, overlapping. She worked at the golf course. Now, we're, we're going to get yelled at again. Now, do you know where she works at the golf course? No, I don't. I think she is part of the pro shop or something like that. You know, but I... Uh, now, you, you know you're aware that your wife had actually been interviewed by the police about a month earlier. Gosh, I don't know if it was a month earlier. Uh, sometime earlier? It was sometime earlier, yes. And you you had told your wife, in fact, that you had told her that uh, that night that this story about golfing, about Scott golfing. Did you not that he told you that night that he had been golfing? I told my wife, I told my brother, I told a lot of my family members that returned to my home after the police asked us to leave the park. But, but you specifically told your wife. After she told me, he told her he went fishing. You betcha. And, and you're aware that she then interviewed with the police? Yes. And, and did you receive a phone call that night uh, from the police that they're saying they needed to talk to you? I received a phone call from the detective Bertolato. I couldn't tell you exactly the date. And we arranged because of my conflict for work schedule and his to meet, yes. And it was about six weeks later, approximately. Does that sound right? Gosh, it could have been, yeah. Uh, from your knowledge, your wife, from your knowledge, your wife 
You never told the police the story that you told about Scott going golfing. Objection, Your Honor. That's like about two layers of hearsay. His knowledge of what his wife, I mean, she just testified. Sustained. I don't have anything else. Redirect. Uh, just a couple of questions. Mr. Kempel, the counsel asked you, uh, you have a lot of questions about that burnt chicken comment. Uh, can you can you just tell us what you meant by that? When Scott installed his barbecue, uh, which no, was just no, you're up there. no, I fancy. Oh, am I too far down? Yeah, I fancy. I fancy. Mm -hmm. I fancy myself as a barbecuer, which many people do. When Scott installed objection, non-responsive. I think he's trying to answer. Overruled. Go ahead. When Scott installed his barbecue, which was just within a matter of days or weeks prior to us attending that 4th of July barbecue, he burnt chicken. I was trying to tell him to turn the butane down and let the heat of the lava rocks soak the, cook the chicken. He didn't want to pay attention, which he maybe shouldn't have. I don't know. And it burnt and he got upset. All right. Let me. So you saw him upset. Yeah. Over this chicken. Burnt chicken. Right. And in your mind, when you compared when you saw him getting upset over the chicken uh, versus when you saw him on the 24th, did you see a contrast? Yeah, I saw him upset with the burnt chicken. Uh-huh. I didn't see him upset that night about Lacey being gone. Let me, let me ask you just one final question. Uh, when you saw the officers going into, well, not the residence, but the front yard, do you recognize this as a, um, like a diagram of their house? Yes. Okay. It's labeled here courtyard. Yes. And then gate number one. Right. And then fence. Correct. Okay. And when you were talking about them going into the front, you're talking about going into the gate? Correct. And this courtyard area. Yeah, because I approached over there. Okay. And you were over here by the driveway? Correct. And this is a solid fence that you can't see through, right? Right. So once they got in there, you didn't know whether they were going into the house or what? I couldn't tell you. Okay, nothing further. Any questions about the chicken? I would love to revisit. <laughs> we have the we have the narrow rule in California, so let's keep it about the chicken. I would love to revisit the barbecue chicken incident. Are you, in fact, when you discussed the fact that Scott got, I believe your quote is that Scott got pissed off. Yes, he did. About the chicken. And when he was questioned about the chicken being burnt, uh, when he was questioning you about the chicken being burnt, you said he was pissed off. And then, and then he asked you, followed up by, uh, how did he show that? And, and your exact answer was, well, he didn't curse and he didn't throw things, but he just seemed frustrated. Do you recall saying that to that investigator? No. He slammed the cover down on the barbecue and wasn't real happy. Let me put it that way. Okay. And Lacey had made a comment. Well, you actually said, uh, you told the investigator that the only thing visible he did was he made comments, excuse me, not visible, but the only thing that he indicated to you is that, that, that he was upset is that he made comments about the chicken. Do you recall saying that? Yeah. So the extent of his anger that night, he was upset at the great chicken fiasco was that he got a little upset and actually made some comments about the chicken and that was his anger. No, between facial and verbal expression. You've been at the house before. Yes. And you were at the house at the barbecue. Yes. And you were aware that there's no cover on the barbecue. There is a cover. And there was a cover? Yes. Thank you, I have nothing further. It's butane. It is covered. May this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Temple. Thank you. You are excused. Okay. Oh, my God. Fiesta. The great chicken fiasco. Oh, my mm -hmm. God. 
That's so funny. This guy's like seriously has attitude. Hell yeah. But I don't blame him. Let's see. He's a defense attorney. They usually they usually kind of animated. No, no, no. I'm talking about the. I'm talking about. That's Kemple. Kemple. Oh, Kemple. Yeah. Oh, Kemple. Yeah. Are we doing another yeah. one? Or? I Well, let's see. Let me see. I'm just trying to see the chat here because I haven't seen the chat in a long, long time. Uh, They're loving it. Two scooter. She's hungry. I am hungry for barbecue chicken now. Is everybody Are we have 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 barbecue barbecue service? Does anybody Karen. feel like barbecue chicken right now? <laughs> yeah. Karen, I can even Karen's feel that burnt. I think Karen's I can make do with a burnt chicken. I would peel it off or something and get to the center of it or something. I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> Karen's up next. Everybody, who's up next? Karen. Taryn. Karen. Sir Karen Service. Who's that? The next testimony. Oh, okay. Let me see who it is. Do another one, you guys said? Okay. Um, all right. We'll do, we'll do one more. Let's see. It's number 15, you, right? I'm are, you, are you... Are you expecting a phone call or are you needing to make a phone call? No, I'm, let me just check. I'm supposed to expect it. So let me see. What time is this? It's probably, let me see. I didn't miss it. Do we have Neck Brace Karen in? Is Neck Brace Karen in? I don't know if she's here. Is she here? I didn't Lisa. see her. Lisa D. Lisa D. Lisa D. Lisa, 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 okay, Lisa, so Lisa next D. person is, okay. Let's see. Karen Service, the Peterson's neighbor. Is it long? Probably not. Okay. Oh, so who's gonna know. who's gonna do this? Me. I really feel like barbecue chicken. I really do. Yeah, it does sound good. It does sound good. <laughs> the great chicken fiasco. I think I'll take a break and I'm going to take a break and let you th go guys do it this time. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, Nana Patty. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Ms. Service, Servas. Can I call you Karen? No. <laughs> Ms. Servas. Can I call, I can I call you I don't next want you to tell me the address, but do you live on Covina Avenue in Modesto? Yes, I do. And do you live on next door to the Peterson residence? I do. And you were living there on December 24th, 2002? Yes. And how long had you lived at your house? Since August of 92. So you were present during the entire time that Lacey and Scott lived at that house at 523 Covina? Uh-huh, yes. Okay, if you could just, just so the jury has some reference where... Where we're at. Do you see that diagram behind you? Yes. Can you just write, just write the words service home on the side of that house where your house would be? Okay, thank you. Now, when, or let me just ask you this. Did you, what was the relationship with the Petersons, Lacey and Scott Peterson? Your well, I just met Lacey and Scott when they moved, which was in 2000. And I met them just on the front lawn. One day they were out and they were new neighbors. So we spoke and, you know, and, you know, I had a pretty good relationship with both of them. And since they were, you know, since they were your next door neighbors, I'm sure, you know, you saw them regularly. Hi, how's it going? That kind of thing. Absolutely. And you have a son, right? Yes. And did you and your son ever go over to their house for any type of gatherings? Oh, numerous times we did. Okay, what kind of gatherings? We went there for Memorial Day picnic, for a Super Bowl party. We just went occasionally over. I mean, they were neighbors. We went over. I swam in their pool a number of times. Now, how um, in 2002, how old would, you, would your son have been? He would have been, at that time, eight. Okay, and at that time... You were there. Did you know about the about the Petersons putting in a pool? Yes. 
And you said that you and your son would go over, you know, on occasion, I guess, and swim in the pool and just do normal neighbor stuff. Correct. When was the last time that you ever spoke to Lacey Peterson? It was on the after. It was in the afternoon of Sunday, December twenty second. And can you tell what was the? Can you just tell me about the contact? How was it that you came to speak to her? Well, Scott and Lacey were in the front yard mowing the lawn earlier that afternoon, and I had wanted to ask Scott to come over to my house and help me straighten out my Christmas tree. Christmas Lacey tree became angry because she said he shouldn't do that for a neighbor when he should do it for her. For <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking about how your Christmas tree is crooked and he's got to straighten it out. Oh, uh, let's see. Okay. Help me straighten out my Christmas tree. So I, after they were done mowing the lawn, I walked over there and the side gate was open and I went in the backyard and both Scott and Lacey were in the backyard transplanting plants from one side to the other. Okay, um, kind of nervy just walking right in through that gate like that. And it, no, it sounds like, okay. <laughs> okay, when you said that they were both mowing the lawn, were they both side by side pushing that lawnmower? No, no, Scott was mowing the lawn and Lacey was just kind of puttering around the front yard when I saw them. And you said you went into the backyard? Correct. And did you speak to Lacey? Yes, I did. And did she tell you anything about how she was feeling, her physical condition related to her pregnancy? She said she felt really tired. And when we were standing around the pool, she also mentioned that she had almost fallen in the pool. I think it was a couple of weeks before that, that she kind of fell teetery and a little off balance. All right, let's go to the 24th now. I'm sorry, let me finish up with the 22nd. You said that you had wanted the defendant to come over and help straighten up your Christmas tree? Correct. And um, he did that later that day? Yes, he did. And then let's go to the 24th. Were you home on the 24th of 2002? Yes, so I was. Okay, and, and did you at some point during that day find Scott and Lacey's dog, Mackenzie, out in the, um, somewhere on the street? Yes, I did. Okay, we'll get at that in a minute, but let me switch this thing over real quick. Your Honor, I'm going to mark this whole binder. We'll mark it A through... Next in order, this is 27, which is a binder. How many photographs are in there? Oh, let's see. Six. Oh, that you A through something. A through A through what? Uh, six total. A B C D E F. Okay, A through F. Oh, l let's see. What are you mocking? A uh, twenty-seven A through F. Okay. Now, just so we know. We're talking about the right dog. This is People's 27A, and do you recognize that dog? Ms. Service? Yes, yeah, that's uh, Mackenzie. And um, is that a fair representation of what the dog looked like on December 24th, 2002? Yes. And let me show you this binder of pictures, 27A through F. You just looked at 27A, so go ahead and look through the rest of them and tell me when you're done. Okay, I'm through. Okay, before we, uh, before we show these to the jury, let me have you do one thing. Let me ask you, do the pictures in the binder, the ones you haven't talked about, 27B through F, 27F, do these accurately reflect how your home in the Peterson's residence at 523 looked on December 24th, 2002. Yes. Okay. While we're here, I'm going to have you do one more thing. Take a look at 27B. Is that a picture of your home? Yes. And did you find Scott Peterson's dog, Mackenzie, out in front of your home sometime on December 24th, 2002? Yes, I did. Okay. Before we get started, I'm just going to pull this picture out and draw a circle where it was that you found this dog? Okay, would be 
right about here. Do you just want me to put an X? A circle, please. Okay, and when you first saw the dog, When I first saw the dog or when I touched the dog? Oh, when you first saw the dog. Okay, that would be, it would be right about here. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm messed up. It's okay. You're not, you're okay now. Just, do you want me to put an X? Do you want? Do you want me to put an X? Do you want me to just put an X? No, just put a one for where you first saw it. Okay. And then on the bottom of that picture, can you just put your name, Karen Service, and so that we remember later who we're talking to? Right there is fine. Okay. Then on this picture, you can go and you can also put a two where you first touch the dog. I would be right here. Okay. And do you want to make the one just a little larger because you can't have made it very small? I can't even see it. I'm trying. Okay. It's not showing up. No, it's showing up very well. Uh, there is a black one behind you that might be a little better. Uh, a little bit. Not really. Okay. Okay. Hold on to that binder and let's just start at 27B. Okay. Take a look at the screen for me if you could. Oops. It will help if you turn it on. Uh, what picture are we looking at here in the binder? That would be 27B. And if I use the mouse, where is it? Okay, let's start. Let's take the jury through what happened there in the morning. Okay. In the morning, you were getting up. You're ready to leave your house on the 24th. You had to go do some errands? Yes, I was. And you walk out of your house, correct? Yes. Okay. And um, this is your driveway right here, your point right there, right? Yes, that's yes. my driveway. Okay, so this is your white house. Correct. And the Peterson home is this greenhouse right next to it. Correct. The, so you walk out of your house, and where was your car parked? My car was parked all the way up the driveway where I always park it. Okay, so you is. can almost see it there behind the... Yeah, that's where it was. Okay, so your car is parked there. Just so the jurors know, they are these pictures were not actually taken on the morning of the 24th, right? Correct. Uh, so you get into your car, right? Uh-huh, yes. And, and you do what? I backed out of my driveway to... Your front back, end. Back, your front end. My front end. As I backed out, it would have been facing south. My front end was facing south. I was going out on onto Encino, which is the street that's over here. Okay. It's south of the house. Okay. And we're looking at Covina down the street here. This little trail that leads to the park is down here? Correct. So if we look at the picture, it's to the left. And then? Yes. Yes, yes. So you backed out of your driveway, and so you probably backed out this way. So your front end was facing down towards Encina. Yes, it was. And then what happened next? I looked out my driver's side window and Mackenzie was standing on the street looking at me. Okay, so the dog that we saw earlier was standing in the street? Yeah, correct. And where, if I, if I used the house, where was he? He was move a little bit more up the street. Let me see if this might show up. Yeah, let me uh, give you a laser pointer. This might show up better. As I backed out, he was right about here, right about here. And that's about the location where you're marked on the picture in front of you, right? Correct. Okay, and then what happened next? Well, I saw that he was by himself, so I pulled over here. Mm -hmm. Pulled my car over. I got out of the car. I walked over to him. By the time, by that time, he had he had gone to basically the end of my bumper, my driver's side bumper. So he was standing right in front of the driveway at that point. Okay, let me click. This was 27B. Let me go to 27C. There it is. 
So this is a little bit closer. Can you show us, hold on, let me go to 27B. This is looking directly at your house. Can you show me on here where you saw him? Yes, the first time was here in the street. When I went and got out of my car, he had moved to here, to there. Okay, and so you get in your car and then what happened next? I walked over to him. I saw that he had his leash on and he was just standing there. So I went over to him and checked his tags to make sure he was actually McKenzie and he was. Okay, and what time was it when you found the dog? It was sometime, well, after backtracking my receipts, I determined that I found the dog about 10, 18, 10, 18 a.m. And we'll talk about the receipts in a minute. So after you found the dog and you checked his tags, what did you do next? I took his leash in my hand and I walked across the, my lawn and across to Scott and Lacey's house and I tried to open the front gate. Okay, so you went across your lawn. Correct. And when you had the dog, you were holding him as you were walking him to the house, to, to the Peterson's house. How were you holding him? By his fur? By his collar? By the leash? By the leash. By the leash. Okay, so the leash was still attached. Correct. Okay, can you describe for the jury the condition of the leash? Uh, the leash had, it was dirty, it had leaves, and like grass clippings on it. It was moist. Sounds like caca. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> was the land, was the lawn wet that morning? My lawn was. It was overcast that day. It hadn't rained in, it hadn't rained in a couple of days, but the lawns were pretty dewy and moist from the fog. And do you do you remember whether the dog's coat, you know, whether the dog's coat was wet or was it dry? It was dry. So you take the dog and you take him across your lawn here. Is that right? Correct. I'm traveling in the right direction, and we look at this picture from the middle towards the right. Correct. Now, this is uh, 27E. Yes, it is. Okay, all right. Now, you said you went and you tried that front gate. Correct. And is the front gate, that's the front gate right here, right? Yeah, right, right there. Okay, so you walk across your lawn, and you tried the front gate. Is that right? Yes, I did. What happened? Well, I felt felt a little panic because the gate was locked, but then I heard some raking in the backyard. And so I figured I'd go try and see if the side gate was unlocked or open. So you walk up there, you try the gate, you didn't get in. And did you continue across the lawn? Yes, I did. And you said that you went to the side gate? Yes, I noticed that Lacey's car was there. So I went and as I came around the corner, the side gate, which is located right here, was open. It was ajar. And so I figured she must be in the backyard. So I walked into the backyard with the dog. And where was Lacey's car parked? It was parked up in the drive. I mean, it was up in the driveway. I don't know if it was on the right or the left side, but it was right about here. And about were right you here. familiar with the defendant's truck? Yes. And you recognize Scott Peterson as he sits here in the courtroom? Yes, absolutely. And so Lacey's car was parked in the drive. Yes. And look at People's 12 behind you, the diagram there. And when you see, not the pickup truck, but the one that's labeled 4M, where you see that, is that the approximate place Lacey's car was? I don't know if it's the exact place, but that's how far up to the gate that the car was parked. Okay. And where was Scott Peterson's truck? It was not there. I didn't see it. Did you ever see, I mean, did you ever see Scott Peterson leave at all that morning? No. Um, so. No, so. So Lacey's car is parked here and the gate is open, you said? Yes. And one more thing on the diagram. This diagram, People's 12, shows the gate that you're describing. And do you see it right here, gate number two? Yes, I do. And the gate is swung open outwards towards the vehicles, correct? Oh, excuse me. Correct. Okay. Correct. And is that the way you saw it on the 24th of December? Yes. Okay. And the gate swings out towards the street? Yes, it does. 
Okay, and this is just a little bit, this is the 27F, people's 27F, a little bit closer of these same areas. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay, can you do me a favor now? Take that blue marker that you're using and on the people's 12, can you uh, write a dash line where you went with the dog? From the point that I started? Yeah, the diagram doesn't really show where your house is or where you found the dog, right? No, it doesn't. So, and where you found the dog on People's 12, where you wrote, where you have wrote service home, can you, it would be a little further to the left. Yes. Now, can you just write this, can you write this, found dog, and put an arrow uh, towards the area, to the left? Okay. And then can you write, can you show us like a dash line, the route that you took, what you did with the dog, you know, the backyard, so I went around, which is normally where I would go through the gate, and then I walk with the dog along the cement by the pool up to the right and around the end of the house, and then I looked to the left, I didn't see anything, but the noise I had originally heard when I was up there at the gate, I determined was coming from either the Hogan's backyard or the Dunger's backyard. I think it was the Hogan's. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was confused. I'm like, where's my part? <laughs> the dungers. Let me stop you. I'm thinking no, this kidding. guy is, is right. just is discussing a little bit too much about where you're supposed to write the line. I was thinking it was like the family circus guy with all that <laughs> dotted line. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, that was. So my Let line was, and then you. can you write, can you show moment. us with a dash line, like the route you took, what you did when you, with the dog? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you go there. Okay. Okay. This is where I went to the front gate, and the gate was locked, and I heard the noise coming from the backyard, so I went around, which is normally where I would go through the gate, and then I walked with the dog along the cement by the pool up to right here at the end of the house, and I looked to the left, I didn't see anything, but the noise that I originally heard was when I was up here at the gate, I determined was coming from either the Hogan's backyard or the Dunger's backyard. I think it was the Hogan's. Well, let me stop you. Those were other neighbors? Yes. Uh, let's cool. let's have her mark. Oh, no, no, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's have her. <laughs> Let's have her mark the path, just as KS, just as KS, anywhere along the dotted line, just put a KS, just put NKS, okay, whatever, so we don't know that's where you went. What's the KS stand for? So we know, wait, anywhere along the dotted line, just put a KS, oh, so we know initials. that's where you went. Okay. Some typos. Oh, you know, actually, can I just have her put service with dog so we can later remember? Whatever, whatever, as long as we can identify who it is. Now just write service and, and slash dog. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, that's fine. And then you said you heard a noise, right? And what kind of noise was it? It was the sound of somebody t raking. And, and when you went into the backyard, you determined that it was coming from a different neighbor's yard. Correct. Did you see anything in the backyard? Nothing. No. People? No. Any activity going on there at the house that you observed? No. No activity. All right. And so what did you do next? I turned around with the dog. Mm-hmm. And walked back along to here and back through the covered patio area. And then this is where I basically, you know, said, Mackenzie, stay. You know, said bye-bye and shut the gate and I left. Okay, and the dog, you were familiar with the dog from the times you went over to the house. Oh yeah, very familiar. You can, you can put the pen down now, okay? Um, <laughs> so when you left, you put the dog in, left, and shut the gate. Yes. Now, did you take that dog off the leash? No, I did not. And what's the next thing that you did that day? 
I walked back across the lawn and my hands were full of like the leaves and grass clippings and things that were on the leash. And so I went, I was just going to go ahead and rub them on my jeans and go, but I decided not to because they were pretty dirty. So I went in my house and washed my hands. Okay. This is people's D again. So you went back to where? You went inside and you washed your hands? This is 27D we're looking at. And did you get in your car then? Yes, I walked back out of my house, back down the driveway, since my car was in the street at that point. Okay. You didn't say you locked the door, but I'm sure you locked your door. Okay. Did you see what was going what was going on in the street at that time? At that time that I walked out of my house, mm -hmm. there was just, there was a gentleman that was walking down the street past my car. It was a Caucasian gentleman, balding. He looked like he had been walking down in the park. Is that unusual for people to come past your house to get to that trail at the end of the park? We have a lot of people that do that. Okay, so that was not unusual. It's not unusual. And did you see anything else? Nope. And did you see the Krigbaums across the street? I mean, were they out? No. I mean, I mean, Amy Krigbaum is who I meant. No. The next door across the street neighbors are the Medinas, correct? Correct. Were they out? No. You didn't see them. Okay, so you get, you wash your hands, you get in the car, you put your seatbelt on, I hope. Where do you go? <laughs> I put my seatbelt on. I drove to the Bank of America and there were no parking spaces. I circled the bank twice and decided to move on to the next place that I needed to go, which was Austin's Christmas store. Oh, that sounds like a nice place to go. And the La Loma area that you live in, how far is that from the downtown area where the Bank of America is that you went to? In approximate terms? Mm -hmm. About a mile. And then you went from the Bank of America to where? Well, after I circled the bank twice, I went into Austin's Christmas store, which is very nice, by the way. And did you go into that store? Yes, I did. I was did, looking for elves. Did they have, yeah, I was just going to ask you about elves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, is that, and is that store downtown somewhere also? Yes, it's downtown. And you went in and what did you do? I went in and purchased some Christmas ornaments. Uh cute little elves, paid for them and left the store. And what did you do next? Next, I went to Starbucks downtown. You get a cold brew? I did, it was wonderful. One time I asked for one hot. Okay. Did you have any needed? Sorry. <laughs> while, while you were in Sorry, between judge. Austin's and Starbucks, did you make a phone call? Yes, I did. Who did you call? Tom Egan. A name sound bank, right? Oh, I did, yes. Uh, and then what else did you Order do? Order in the court. <laughs> <laughs> what else did you do that morning? After Bank America, mm -hmm. of America? Yeah. I went up McHenry Avenue to Prime Shine Express and got my car washed. Okay. And since this jury doesn't really have any idea of those areas that we're talking about, how far is the Prime Shine car wash from the Starbucks downtown? From Starbucks or from Bank of America? From Bank of America. Can I use approximates? Sure. Because I haven't clocked that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably close to three, between three and four miles up McHenry. Okay. And the, after going up there, where did you go? I went to the Save Mart at Scenic and Oakdale. And just so we're clear with that what that might actually be is that area no i don't think it's on the map so we won't worry about it okay you went to the save mart and then what happened after i went grocery shopping i went home and did and then you stayed home for some period of time yes i did i'm good you spent a lot of money uh do you remember what time it was when you left your home it was about five after four Okay, now do you remember testifying at the preliminary hearing did you testify at the preliminary hearing Yes, I did. And do you remember testifying at the preliminary hearing that you left your house that day around 5.05? Correct, I did say that. And did you later go back and check some records which helped you determine the time you left your home? Yes, I did. And what records did you look at? 
I looked at my day timer and my Microsoft Outlook I, and saw that I actually needed to be somewhere that day at four o'clock. And when I left my house that day, I knew I was five minutes late to wherever I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be at a Christmas party. And for the, some reason, I thought it was 505, but when I checked, it was actually 405. It's surprising and you had that planner too. So using that day timer entry, did that refresh your memory about the time that you left was actually 405? Yes. Okay, now did you at some point that evening receive a call from Scott Peterson saying something to the effect of Lacey's missing, have you seen her, something like that? He called me, I'm not sure of the exact time. I know it was after 8.30 and asked me if, if I knew where she was. I said, no. And he said, well, she's missing. And then something to the effect that there are people searching for her down in the park. There's helicopters and things. Because I told him I wasn't there. I was up in Ripon, Ripon, Ripon. And I told him, well, I found Mackenzie. And he said, hold on. And he put me, he put me on the phone with a detective. And did you talk to a detective that night? Yes, I did. At some point, were you asked, or did Scott Peterson call you and ask you if you could more definitively define exactly what time you found the dog? Yes, I did. Okay. What time did you initially tell the police that you found the dog? I told them it was about 1030. And, and did you find some records that helped you really narrow that time frame down to when you actually found the dog? Yeah, I, first I found my receipt from Austin Christmas Store. And then I received my cell phone records when my cell phone bill came. Okay. Alicia? Alicia? Your Honor? Um, Your Honor, it's Do you want that mark? Oh, is that what he's? Yes. Do you want that mark next in order? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, this is People's 28. It's a receipt from the Austin Christmas store. All right. And what did you find? And when did you find this particular receipt? I found it in my jeans pocket on December 28th when I went to do my laundry. And I showed you People's 28 there. Is that, a, is that an actual receipt that you found? That's my receipt. Okay. What time was it that it shows that you made a purchase at Austin's Christmas store? It says 1034 a.m. Miss Service, this is so faint that I don't think it's going to show up on the document camera. So can you just read where it's from, the date and the time? It says Austin's Christmas Store, 12-24-2003, 10-34 a.m., clerk number one. Let me see the date. I think you said 2003. I said, oh, no. I said, did I say 2003? That's what I heard. 2002, 12-24-2002. The date that's on there is 12-24-2002. Correct. The after you found the receipt, and then did you also get your cell phone bill, and did you look up the call where you called, you said, Tom Egan? Yes, I did. I'll have this marked next in order, Your Honor. It's a cell phone bill. 29, cell phone bill. And do you remember calling Mr. Egan after you left Austin's Christmas store? Right. I called him after I left Austin's, and he returned my call after I got out of the car wash. Okay. Do you see the phone call? Let me just ask you, is People's 29 a copy of your cell phone records? Yes. And do you see that phone call that you just told us about on those records? Yes. And what time was that phone call made? The phone call that I made after I got out of Austin, got yeah. out of Austin's yes. is at 10.38 a.m. Can you just take this highlighter and highlight that on the bill? Okay. Just highlight yeah. where that call is. Yeah, just highlight where that call is. Did you then at some point, after getting these documents and looking at the times, did you then try to recreate the events that you did that morning in order to try to backtrack and, um, you know, the time to where you think you found the dog? I recreated the events after I found this receipt. 
but before I got my cell phone records. Okay, and can you tell, just tell the jury what you did? Well, what I did was basically went through the motions of that morning. I opened the door out of my house. I went into my car, backed out of the driveway in the same direction that I did. And at the same time that I imagined finding Mackenzie, I started my stopwatch. And then I pulled my car to the side of the road and went through the exact motions that I went through, including going into my house, getting back into my car, driving around the Bake Up America twice, pulling up in front of Austin's, and that's the point that I stopped my watch. Okay. And based on that recre- recreation that you did, is that how you were able to determine that you found the dog at approximately 10, 18 in, in the morning? Correct. And then you said you must have received a phone call on the 28th from Scott Peterson asking you if you could kind of narrow your time frame down or kind of find uh, by minute when you actually found the dog. Yes, he left a cell phone message for me. And is that call also reflected on those phone records in front of you? I don't know if his incoming call. You know what? Yeah, it's actually on the second page. I'm not sure if his incoming call is shown on here because it went to voicemail. But my call responding back to him, which was approximately an hour and a half later, is listed on here. Okay. And where were you at the time? I was in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And what date was it when you called him back? Uh, 28th of December. Can you take this highlighter again and just highlight that call showing when you called him back? When I called him back? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, on the 24th, you said you were in uh, Ripon? Ripon? Yes. Okay. Uh, During, uh, with this initial investigation, and Lacey was missing, and all that was going on? Yes. And just for the jury's information, Ripon is a small town. It's maybe 10 or 15 miles north of Modesto? That's correct. And you were there just for a holiday dinner? Yeah, a holiday gathering. All right. And the next day, did you go to Scott Peterson's home? On a number of occasions, yes. And we've heard testimony, it's fair to say, that people were kind of in and out of the house, like the people around the neighborhood searching, that kind of thing. Yes. And were you, did you ever go over there sometime in the evening? I went over about five o'clock. And what was the purpose of going over there? I wanted to see the five o'clock news out of Sacramento to see if they had a report about her being missing. And did you, since the jury doesn't know you, okay? Uh, Do you not have a television set, uh, or how is it that you couldn't watch the TV in your own house? Well, I have direct TV satellite, and I didn't subscribe to the local channels. Probably so you had more money to buy elves. And you know that Lacey and Scott had those channels. Yes, it was for the elves. And, And you knew they had those channels? Yes, I did know that. Okay. Order in the court. So, so when you went over there, who was there at your house? Scott was there, Lee and Jackie. They had just arrived, and I believe Renee Tomlis- Tomlinson and her husband. And Jackie and Lee are who? Scott's parents. Okay, did you see, do you see them sitting in the front row of the court? Yes, here? I do. Okay. And, uh, did you watch the news? I did, yes. And were people still kind of coming in and out at that time, or is it just those folks you told us? It was just them. Uh, there may have been one or two other people. I don't recall at the time, you know, that that were actually there. If they were, there were people that I don't know. So you stayed there and you watched the news? Yes, correct. And then where did you go? I went home. And did you receive a call at some time, um, at some point, to go back to the house? Yes, approximately 10 minutes later. While you were there, did you, were you asked to stay for a Christmas dinner? I was asked to stay, yeah. They were going to have turkey for dinner, and I was asked to stay to eat. And this was the first time you were there, around 5 o'clock? Yeah, uh, probably it was around 5.15, 5.20-ish. Okay, what did you tell them? I said, no, I'm a vegetarian. You couldn't have just have vegetables? <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry. 
I have packing I need to do. I'm leaving for New Mexico the next day. So I think I'll just go home. And then you received a call 10 minutes later. Who called you? Scott did. What did he say? He said, well, I found some cheese tortellini. Hmm. Would you, to paraphrase, paraphrase, you know, would you reconsider? Would you come over? Okay. And I said, okay. So you went over. And who was at the house that time? Scott, Lee, and Jackie. So the defendant and both of his parents. Correct. Now, what was the defendant's parents? What was Lee Peterson's demeanor when you went over there? He was really upset. I mean, he was crying and upset. Uh, what about Jackie Peterson? Jackie was upset as well. And how would you describe the defendant's demeanor? He was pretty calm. He wasn't, I mean, you know, I had already seen him upset during the day. So he had pretty much, he was pretty calm at that point. And did, um, what went on during that dinner? Well. Well, let me just ask you this. Who cooked that dinner? Objection, relevance. Yeah, unless it, unless it is going to clear up something or. No, I'll make an offer uh, if you want outside the presence, but this is absolutely no relevance to any of this. Does it have any relevance as to what went on during dinner? No, I mean, I was just using that for background. I'll skip over it. So they had dinner. Yeah, you had dinner and then, well, let me just go right into it. Did Scott Peterson say anything about the police taking a gun from his house? Yes. What did he say? He said that he was a little upset because when he got back from wherever he had been the night before, that he noticed when he got home that the police had taken his gun and some rags out of the washing machine without his knowledge. Did he say where they took the gun from? He said he took that the police had taken it from the house. Nothing further, Your Honor. Mr. Garagos. Thank you. Do you want to turn this off now? No, they can leave it on. I, I, I may use it. You're going to use it. Okay. Good morning, Karen. How are you? I'm good. Good. Starting, I'm going to go through, I'm going to track a little bit of what the prosecutor was asking you. Okay. The, uh, you said the last time, I'm sorry. Could I get a drink really quick? Uh, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, we'll excuse you for Thank a little you. bit. I'll be distracted. We'll take a five minute recess. All right. Well, or, let's we'll take a 30 second I'll check. I'll, I'll, I'll check with the jury and see how they're holding up. I need salsa. You need some salsa. Yeah. She needs some salsa. She's going to be very dry. I'm going to ask a lot of questions. She's, she's going to be parched. I, yeah. I can't do that accent. All right, I'm bad. Okay, how's everybody you're, doing in the jury box here? I'm not looking at the chat, so. I'm just taking a look now that I can look while she's getting the seltzer. Hi, Lisa D. Oh, Lisa D, we're doing Karen, the neighbor. Karen, the neighbor. I can't do it. I'm too Colorado. I'm too West Coast. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know people think Colorado's Midwest. We are not Midwest. No. uh yeah. She's not Grace Karen. I can't do it either. Right, you ready? Well, let's go. Okay. Let me get back to the script. I'm eating pickles. Let me get one drink. Sorry, they're loud. Okay, hang on. No, I have to drink constant. This writing is so, like, you have to really just be on it. I know. There should be spaces. And I'm like, should be color -coded. and the names, and it's like... Okay. Right. See, it came up the right way, though, finally, for me. You you said the last See? time. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. You got spaces. That's good. Okay. Uh, you said the last time that you saw Scott and Lacey together was on the 22nd. Is that right? Sunday, the 22nd, yes. Okay. And that was approximately what time? It was between 2 and 3. It was in the afternoon. Okay. And it was not uncommon for you to go over there to the house unannounced, so to speak. Not uncommon at all. Okay. In fact, you had a, uh, at that time, you had an eight-year-old boy. Correct. And your eight-year-old boy would go swimming with uh, Scott in the pool and play at the house on occasion. Isn't that true? Primarily just swimming in their pool. Yeah. 
Okay, and uh, he, Scott, would come over to your house and you would ask him on occasion to come over to do things, like on the 22nd, straighten the tree, uh, other kinds of chores, I take it, uh, odds and ends around the house. He had helped me on a number of, of occasions with things that I maybe physically couldn't handle. So, so is it fair to say you're, you're a single mother and you're not exactly huge, so if you need something to be moved or helped out around the house, uh, he would do that on occasion. Yeah, he, yes, he would. Uh, whenever I asked him to do something, he would. If he had time to do it, he would come and do it. Okay. And it was helpful. Is it fair to say that he was a, uh, both he and Lacey, were, they, they were good neighbors? Absolutely. The, uh, do you belong to the Rotary? Modesto Rotary, downtown Rotary Club. Yes, I do. And that Scott just joined at the Rotary before the disappearance. Actually, he had been a member for a while, I think possibly up to a year prior to that. Now, had he taken Lacey to the Rotary? I mean, do you remember right before that, that uh, and introduced her and baby Connor to the Rotary Club? I don't recall being present if that happened, no. Okay. Now, on the 22nd, that he, when he came over, uh, what did you have him do? Straighten up your Christmas tree? I, he got under the tree and I held up the trunk and he straightened the tree from underneath. Okay, uh, your son also, I think a, a collection out, a house collection of miniatures of some kind. Yeah, they were, they were there. I'm not sure exactly where, but they were there. And, and was your son present on the 22nd? Yes, he was in the house. Okay, uh, Scott was interactive with all of these, uh, uh, greet him, or uh, they knew each other by name, I take it? Yeah, I don't know how much they actually talked that day. I don't recall that. Okay, now on the 22nd, when you went over, uh, this would have been before he came over to the house to pick uh, to arrange the Christmas tree for you, right? Correct. Okay, and when you, when you went over, the first thing that you noticed was Scott was mowing the lawn and Lacey was out front with him. Well, when I first went over, they had had, they were already through mowing the yard. Okay. They were already in the backyard when I went over. Okay, and you said they was transplanting. What was Lacey physically doing? She was standing. Okay, and and would she bend down to help out or was she doing anything? No, she was basically, Scott would be, Scott went over to the fence, dug up the perennials to transplant. And then she was, you know, showing where she wanted it to go. Okay. So he was doing the work. She was directing. Okay. Which, uh, from what I understand, was not uncommon. No, no. She knew what she wanted and where she wanted it. The work that she was, uh, that was being done around the house. I, I assume that uh, you were the neighbor while, while they were redoing the yard as well. Yes. And Scott was usually the one that would be doing all that kind of work. Well, it depends on the project. I mean, if you want to talk specifics, I can't remember specifically when he did the brick or this or that, but generally they would work together, whether it happened to be a planting, whether it happened to be a planning project. She did a lot of the planting herself and actually moved things around a lot during the time that they were working, during the time that they were living there. Okay, now on the 23rd, uh, you were home, I take it? On the 23rd, that would be Monday. That would have been a Monday. I was at work. Okay, what time did you get home? I can't recall the exact time I got home on Monday. Okay, and did you spend the night there, Monday night, the 23rd? The 23rd? Absolutely, yeah. You're, so I'm sorry, the 23rd. Absolutely, yes. Okay, and your son was home also? No, he was over at his aunt's house. Okay, did you hear anything unusual on the night of the 23rd? No. Okay, you apparently got fairly keen ears because you were able to hear raking at a neighbor's yard on the 24th, so I assume your hearing's okay. My hearing is fine, thank you. Okay, the morning of the 24th, you estimate at least, let me go through the timeline in a second, uh, how you got to it, but your estimate was that uh, you were home until at least 10.15, right? Correct. Okay, and did you hear anything unusual that morning? No. Okay. The way, uh, you know, when you got the first call from Scott, that was on the 20th, uh, the 24th. That was approximately 8 o'clock. 
Well, since I have my phone records in front of me now, sure. the incoming call to Ripon was at 8.48 p.m. So it's right here. Call number 114. Right. It says an incoming call. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> but you're right. It says an incoming call. Right. Karen, it's you, you with us, call. Karen, or you checked out for the day? Well, you didn't read your line. You skipped it. Okay. Call number 114 848, and it says you were a rip on. Right. It says an incoming call. Hmm. And the incoming call was from, can you tell? Well, it doesn't say the numbers on Verizon bills. It says that there's an incoming call. That is my phone number. That's when he called me. I only got one call when I was up at the Christmas party, and that call was from him. And the call was from him. What did he say exactly? What did he ask you? I don't know exactly what he asked me. I can paraphrase it. Sure. Unless do you have a copy of what he said or? No, no, I was just, they weren't wiretapping that early on. Okay, sorry. He said, you know, Karen, it's Scott. I'm just paraphrasing. He said, you know, we're trying to narrow the timeline to see if it ties with the burglary at the Medina's house across the street. If there's any way that you can get, you know, more exact with your timing of when you found the dog. I appreciate it. I'm just paraphrasing. And that's on the 24th. That he made that call to me? Is that right? No, the call, the call that I just described. Right. Was on the 28th. On the 28th. When I was in New Mexico. Right. Let's go back to the 24th. The 24th, I spoke to him that day. Right. So when did you speak to him? When he called me at 8.48 p.m. Okay, that's the one I'm talking about. Okay. Now let's just focus on the 8.48 and then I'll... Okay, because I thought you had switched. No, no. Okay. No, the 8.48, you were there. 8.48, I was at Ripon at a friend's house. Okay, you're having your Christmas Eve dinner. Christmas Eve dinner. Right. Absolutely. Now you get a call from Scott. Yes. And in this call, what does he say to you? He said to me, you know, Karen, this is Scott. Have you seen Lacey today? I said, no, but I found Mackenzie. And he said, well, Lacey's missing. And I went through the same thing that I told you before, or told Mr. DeStasso before, you know, the helicopters and all that. Right. And then he, when I told him I found the dog, he put me on the phone with the detective to find to describe the dog. Right. So as, as soon as uh, he found out that uh, you had some information about Mackenzie, about finding Mackenzie, he immediately put you on the phone with uh, the detective, correct? Yes, he did. Okay. And do you remember what you told that detective? I don't remember specifically what I told him. At that point, I mean, I was just in shock. So. There was a, do you remember? You probably don't. But do you remember if you talked to which detective you talked to? Uh, that evening, I don't remember the name of the detective that I talked to on the phone after Scott passed it off. Uh, like I said, you know, I was upset. I was in shock. So I don't remember who I talked to, but I know I talked to a detective. Uh, when you talk to, and this is, I mean, I keep prefacing uh, so that we don't want to skip around. This is still on the 24th. This is the first time that you heard that finding the dog may have something to do with Lacey's disappearance, correct? Correct. Okay. Because, I mean, it's a fair statement that morning that uh, you didn't think that there was anything. I mean, uh, you thought it was uh, unusual that the dog's out there without, well, without, with, with the leash, uh, but uh, you didn't realize that it uh, could have been so important until you got that call, correct? Yeah, that's true. Okay. Now, when you talked to that detective, you told him that you were preparing to leave your residence on 1224 at, uh, at almost 1030 a.m., is that correct? I don't know if that's what I told Detective Bueller the next morning on the 25th, but I don't know if that's what I told the detective that evening on my cell phone. Okay. Do you remember what you told them on that evening on the, your cell phone? I, in general terms, because again, I was a little frazzled at that point. 
just had found out the dog in front of my house, just that I had found the dog in front of my house before I left to run errands. Okay. So when you, you told them that, uh, you said that we'll talk to you tomorrow morning or something like that. Well, I asked to talk to Scott again. No, uh, Okay. And then they put Scott back on the phone. Mm, hold on a second. Okay, you talked to Scott. Yeah, I know. I find a place I move my thing. Okay, okay, you talked to Scott. I said, what's going on? How are you? What's happening? And he was just like, I don't know. I don't know. They're looking for her. And then that was basically the call. Okay, now on the, on the 25th, you said you saw Scott a number of times. Yeah, yes. And, and you had seen him upset a number of times, correct? He was. I don't know if you call it upset. He was pretty just... Not focused? Looked like he was in shock. I mean, that's how I interpreted it. He was in shock and just kind of, you know, had the posters and was out with friends, stapling posters up on the flag, uh, up on the pole, up on the flag poles and things like that. Okay. Um Excuse me, I'm sorry. Okay, focused on as much as, as one can be in that kind of emotional strife, uh, focused on trying to find Lacey. Objection, that's argumentative. Judge? Sustain, sustained. Uh, calls for speculation. Uh, when you say he was in shock, was he responding to you? Yeah, but usually just, you know, I mean, he was kind of even, even-toned. A flat? Flat, yeah, that would be a fair assessment. Okay. When did you talk to Beulah? It was between 11 and 12 on Christmas Day. Okay, and so I'll ask you. I assume that they've shown you all the reports, the, all the reports in connection with you. I have seen them, yep. Okay, and Beulah writes that you told him that you were leaving your residence at uh, almost 10.30 a.m. I told him that that, that morning, yes. And that you were uh, you were backing uh, the day that you said you removed from what it was actually uh, that it was one day removed from when it had actually happened. Correct. Okay. Uh, day day you were backing out of the driveway, and that you would have been the picture that's up here, right? Yes. And is this the car you were in? That's my car. Okay. And, and as you're backing up out of the driveway, how far in the street were you before you saw uh, Mackenzie? Well, I had backed the car out this way. It was basically parallel to the curbing here. And I saw him here as I was backing out. So the car was already all the way out into the street. Okay. So when you say you were backing out so that you were going to go ahead in the direction that I've got the car, sir, and going in that direction. It would be going south. And then that's away from the park, the park. It's going to be going down the park. It's down in the direction over this way. It would be going north towards Scott and Lacey's house. Now, when you saw the dog, and by the way, the dog was closer to your curb than to the Medina's curb. To my curb. Okay, to your curb. And and in the middle of the street. In the middle of the street when I first saw him. And uh, heading uh, this direction towards the Colvina house. Was he heading in the direction? Yeah, which direction was the dog facing? He was... If you were the jury... It was like he was coming around toward me, so his head was south and his rear was north. So facing yeah, the same direction that you were. As I'm pulling out, he's just there and his head's here. So he came. So as he came, it was like he came from behind my vehicle. Okay, so he could have, I mean, he could have just been, he could have just been heading from the park direction. Oh, ob objection. That's speculative. Um, I just lost my space. Um, well, no. Well, uh, he was heading away from the park, wasn't he? Well, his body, when I saw him, he was standing there. He wasn't like running. He was standing there. And the way he was positioned was his head was facing south and his butt was facing north. Okay, now, well, when you saw him, did you then back up or go right back into the driveway? No, I went here, and I pulled up to the curb here, and I parked my car and got out. And, and then you, you got out, and you just grabbed the leash? No, I got out, and I looked at him. It looked like Mackenzie. 
and then I grabbed his collar to make sure he was Mackenzie. I read the tag, and then I grabbed the leash. Okay, now when you took him back over here, you said uh, the gate, the front gate. I guess that's what they call the front gate because you said uh, the walkway there was locked, right? Yes, it was locked. And then there was another gate. Uh, it was right here. Correct. And now that gate is normally closed, correct? Yes. Okay. And the dog is normally behind the gate, right? Correct. And that morning the gate was wide open. Yes. Yes, it was wide open. Okay. So you, do you know if it was on a 90 degree angle or it was flat against the fence itself? Do you remember? I can't remember if it was flat against the fence, but it was wide open. It wasn't, it was at least 90 degrees. It was wide open. Okay. And you had heard the dog barking. H had you heard the dog barking at any point while you were either in the house or when you came out of the house? While I was in my house? Yes. No, I didn't hear the dog bark. And, and did you, did the dog bark when you got out of the car? No, he didn't bark. And so you, you grabbed the leash, uh, you, you put the dog back, and you described the way uh, you walked in the backyard already. Correct. And you heard some sounds originally. You said you heard some sounds. You thought it was coming from the backyard. Is that correct? Right. Okay. And then you went back there and you didn't suspect anything unusual, correct? Well, correct. Uh, you didn't see any signs of a struggle or anything in the backyard when you went back there, correct? It was very quiet. So no, I didn't see anything like that. Uh, now, when you talked to Detective Bula on the 25th and you told him that the leash was very dirty and muddy, correct? Yeah, I did tell him that. And you told him that so much so that when you headed back to the residence, it was so like caca, you had to go wash your hands, right? <laughs> oh, my God. Did you really say that? Oh, my God. I might have put the caca in there, but everything else. Okay, I'm like, I'm scrolling back to find it. I'm like, shoot, I didn't see that. <laughs> Everything else is the same. Okay. <laughs> okay. Order in the court. Compose yourself, Miss Service. Do we need to take a... In general, yes. A laugh real. break. And then you returned. Uh, you told him uh, that you recall returning home uh, around noon. It was between 11.45 and noon that I returned home. And, and when you returned home... Uh, you knew that there had been a UPS delivery uh, had been made as you saw the package near the front of the residence. It was a package. Okay. Uh, do you want it to show us where? Yeah, there was a box. Just looked like a square, maybe book box that was sticking out of their mailbox. Later on, I found out it was actually a UPS, not a UPS delivery, but a postal delivery. When I went over the next night, they said that at that that actually had come from the postal service. Excuse me, I drank my seltzer. Too quick, okay. Which would be right, right, because the mail gets delivered between like 10.30 and 11.30 in our neighborhood. Okay. Now, when you came back at noon, you walked back over to the house? No. To see if anybody was there? No. When I pulled in, I could just see that there was something sticking out of the mailbox when I pulled in. Okay. Now, the, uh, you also told Detective Beulah that when you last spoke with Lacey and Scott, they had confirmed that the upcoming birth was going to be a boy and that they had selected the name of Connor, correct? That is what Scott told me when he left my house after straightening the tree. Okay. Now, the next thing you did is you all jumped right over to the 28th phone call. That's when Scott asked if you could pin down when it was the exact time that you had found Mackenzie, right? Right. He asked me to do that. And he told you that the reason that he wanted you to do that is he wanted to see if it was linked to the burglary that had happened directly across the street. Yes, that's the reason he gave in general terms on the mess. That's the reason he gave in general terms on the message. Yes. Okay. And the Medinas, I don't have actually uh, the picture that we're looking at right now. What is it? What does it match on your marking as in the binder 27D? It would be E. Okay. Where? whoever is taking this picture is standing. It looks like it's probably at the Medina's house or in the front yard, isn't it? It looks like they're probably standing on their lawn because that's their hedge to the bottom right. Right. Over there is the hedge that borders the property. The Medina's, yeah. And the yep. burglary that occurred, which would have occurred in the house, right where they're taking that picture from, correct? The lawn that the photographer is standing on is the Medina lawn. 
So that would be correct. And now at this point, uh, you have just found the receipt. You, you went and you looked for the receipt. It was in your pant pocket, right? After Scott's call? Yeah. No, I found the receipt earlier the day in the day of uh, the 28th when I went to do my laundry. I found it in my pants pocket. It was like as I was cleaning my pants out. And the receipt says 1034. Yes, AM. Right. So at that point, you tried to reconstruct exactly what you had done at the time after finding McKenzie and getting over to Austin's uh, based on your assumption that Austin's receipt or the timeline was accurate. Yeah, right. I uh, created it when I got back to Modesto. Right. So you started with the suggestion that the receipt says 1034 a.m. If that's accurate, an accurate time, then you work backwards in terms. And I think you said you had to stop watch time in yourself. Right. And now when you did what you came up with approximately, I think the next time you said the interview, you told the police you thought it was about 10, 1020. Is that correct? No, I wrote it. I wrote a note to Detective Bueller that outlined it specifically. My next contact with them was when I turned it in, the actual physical receipt over. And I hand wrote a note that detailed exactly what I did that morning. And so my next report to them was that it was 1018. Okay, 1018, based on the receipt and working backwards, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, you told the officers, so you wrote the, you wrote the officers a note. You told them that you worked backwards. You told them about your estimate was uh, 16 minutes to do this. Yeah, 11 minutes to drive from my house after finding, you know, finding the dog, going through the motions, driving and getting to Austin's to the point of finding the dog to the point of getting to Austin's was 11 minutes. And I spent what I, I approximated is about five minutes in That's Austin. That's a very short time in a Christmas store like Austin's and finding the elves and everything. Five minutes and you're out of the store. That seems uh, unreasonable. Okay, but I'm not going to go there. We're going to forget that right now. Strike that from the record. Strike it. Okay. Then you and so all of those are based on the, what's the estimate of Austin's for five minutes that's your best guess that yeah, you're sitting there uh, recreating it in your head? Yeah, I mean, 1018 is the latest I could have found the dog because there's no way I could have left any later and did what I did and made the calls that I made and gotten home by that time. I had gotten home. By the time I had gotten home, if it had been later than 1018, that's the latest I approximated. Okay. Um, now, at your preliminary hearing, uh, when I went through about you and I through the timeline and you had, I had asked you about how long you were at the home. And you said that you had gotten there at about 11.45, 12 o'clock. And you had said, do you, re do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember. Yeah, I did say that. Okay. Then I asked you, uh, what did you, when did you next leave your home? And, and you told me that you next left your home at 5.05. Right. I did say that at the prelim. And I said, uh, how do you know the exact time? And you said, because I, as I pulled out of my driveway, I looked at the clock in my car because I was late. And I did. Yeah. Okay. He was five minutes late. It was five. I was five minutes late. Right. That's what I said. Okay. Now, your testimony is here today, though. It looks like there's a supplemental report. And about a year later, I think you spoke with investigator Bertolato. Is that correct? Okay. Well, you're talking about my testimony at the prelim. This, I called Detective Bertolato a day and a half after my testimony and said, wait a minute. I think I made a mistake on the time. Right, right. And well, he apparently didn't do a report until let's see. I spoke with Karen Service on December 11th. He called me back. I called him, okay? I testified on the 13th, right? I called him on the 15th. You testified in, in what month? November 13th. All right. I called him on a Saturday, November 15th. To tell him that when you testify at the preliminary hearing, and I, and I specifically asked you, how do you know the exact time? Right. And your answer was, because as I was pulling out of my driveway, I looked at the clock in my car because I was late. And I think it also says something on the fact, on that, the fact that I can still see the package in Scott and Lacey's mailbox. And I specifically said, okay, so you said you were late and you were supposed to be somewhere at a certain time. 
And the answer was yes. I was supposed to be somewhere at 5 o'clock p.m. And question, I, I said, when you looked at your clock, I mean, yeah, you looked at your clock. Did you, during that time, you were backing in your car at 5.05 and driving away. Did you ever look at the Peterson's home? And you said, yes. And that's when you say, what happened? What, what, when you did that? And did you, did you notice anything? And you did that. I drove past the home and Lacey's car was in the driveway and there was a package in the mailbox. Right. Okay. So wasn't your testimony at the preliminary hearing that you didn't see this package until you left for the day, not when you came back? I saw it at both times. You never testified to that. No, because nobody asked me about that. I specifically asked you, didn't I? And I'll show you your testimony if you want. This is when I drove past the home in the evening. I noticed the package, but you did not ask me if I noticed the package when I came home at 1145. And I didn't notice the package when I came home at 1145. I specifically asked you what happened when you did that. Did you notice anything when you did that? I drove past the home. Lacey's car was in the driveway. There was a package in the mailbox, right? Isn't that what you answered? And that's the same package I saw earlier in the day. You never told anybody up until today that you saw a package in there at 1145 and at 505, did you? Right, because nobody asked me that question at the prelim. Well, somebody asked you exactly what time you left your home that day. That was me, wasn't it? I asked you exactly. How do you know the exact time? Because as I was pulling out of my driveway, I looked at that clock in my car. I was late. Isn't that what you answered? You think this is funny, Mrs. Service? If I was five minutes late to where I was supposed to be. You said, I left my house at 5.40, 5.05. You didn't say, I left my house at 4.05 or five minutes late. I asked you, when did you leave your house? Answer, I left my house at 5.05, correct? Okay, but can we look down here? Uh, trust me, we're going to go through every one of these. Okay. Now, you said I was supposed to be somewhere at 5 o'clock. Isn't that what you said? That is what I said at the prelim, right. And I said, you said you were late. You were supposed to be somewhere at a certain time. You said five o'clock, right? And I was incorrect. Okay. I was incorrect. You were incorrect. I was incorrect because I went back and checked my schedule. And Detective Bertolato or Investigator Bertolato did a report, what, a month later, saying that your testimony at the preliminary hearing was wrong. If that's when he did the report, that's correct. But I notified him less than 48 hours after that. And, the t uh, excuse, excuse me, can you tell me when it says, see if that refreshes your memory, your recollection, as to when you actually talked to him? He called me back. I talked to him. Hold on a minute. You got me all confused Later. now. You're driving me crazy, crazy lady. I'm Mr. sorry. Garagos, I have please, you please don't, Mr. Garagos, please don't insult the witness. I'm sorry. I've had too many monster drinks. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Let me see. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry, Mrs. Service. I should not have spoken to you that way. It's totally out of conduct, professional conduct. Um, You're excused. I'm sorry, Judge. She's got me all confused. I don't even know where I am. Judge, I'm all okay. shook up as well. Can, can, okay, can, the court so, report, can the court reporter please read back the last sentence where we were? Okay. Um, and I said, you were late, and you were supposed to be somewhere at a certain time, and you said 5 o'clock, right? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that it? And I was incorrect. Okay. Uh -oh. um, Let me see. Can I just explain it? No, okay, no, no. no. Oh, no and no, Detective no. Bertolato or okay, Investigator Bertolato okay, and he said... Okay, you, you, you said me you, you, did you last thing I was incorrect because I went back and I checked my schedule. Is that the last thing you said, Mrs. Service? No, that was after that. You no. said uh, he called me back. I talked to him. You say and that, you Mrs. said a month later. Yeah. A month and then later. you go a month later. 
Can yeah, you let me explain right. it, please? Oh, no, sorry. I'm Yolanda. gonna ask the questions. Judge. Now, now, wait, 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 wait. I would like to be able to explain, Your Honor. Now, I will explain. Wait a minute. Just a minute. Hold up. He asks <laughs> the question. You give the answer. Then you can explain it. What's the question? The question is, did you talk to him a month later? Yes, I did. All right. Do you want to explain that? Do you want to explain that? Yes. Explain that. Okay, I called Detective Bertolotto two days after I testified at the preliminary hearing. And I said, I think I've got a problem. And he said, what? And I said, I reflected on my testimony at the prelim. And I realized that there was no way that I could have seen the package at 505 because it would have been dark. So I went back to my day timer, looked to see when I was supposed to be at my friend's house and I was supposed to be there at four o'clock. I knew it was going to be five minutes. I knew I was going to be five minutes late. And I said, what do I need to do? He said, I don't know. Let's wait until the preliminary is over. Let's figure out what we're going to do. We may need to do a supplemental report. And then he called me back on that date in December to do the supplemental report. But I notified him within 48 hours that there was a problem, that I think that I may have given him the wrong time. I want to make sure things are accurate. That's all I want to do. Did you ever tell him that I couldn't have seen the package at 5.05 because it would have been too dark? Right. But I did see that package at 11.45. I saw the package twice that day. I asked you if you told him. When? I told him that when I called him back. I said I couldn't have seen. What I'm saying is the reason I know that I left later is that it would have been too dark for me to see the package at 5.05. So I went back, checked my records, and knew that I had left five minutes late because I was supposed to be there now at four o'clock. Can you read this report and tell me anywhere in that report where it says that you saw that package at 11.45? You... Just, re just read it to yourself. Read it to yourself. <laughs> No, there's nothing in here, but I saw the package at 11.45. You just testified. You just told this jury that you told the investigator that you saw that package at 11.45. Which investigator? Bertolotto. Isn't that what you just testified to, Mrs. Service? No, that's not what I just said. You didn't just say that. I didn't say. Okay, let me. I may have said that to him. Well, you want to know the fact. The fact is that the package, I saw the package at 1145. That is the fact. No matter who I told it to, that's the fact that I saw it when I came home and I saw it when I left. When you talked to Bertolotto, did you tell him it was currently getting near Christmas time and this time of year that Lacey Peterson went missing she noticed it getting dark before five o'clock and that caused her to reflect more closely on the time that she left the house on the evening of 12 24. is that what you told him that probably is a fair representation it's probably not verbatim now, did you tell him that service is sure that she could see a package in the peterson mailbox as she was leaving to go to ripen and as dark as it is at five o'clock she said to me she doesn't think she could have seen that package and doesn't remember it being dark when she left. It wasn't dark when I left that that afternoon. It was That's correct. It wasn't dark when I left that afternoon. Right. And I am asking you, is that what you told him? Yeah. Or did you tell him that you had seen that package that same day at 1145 in the same conversation? No, I didn't say that at the time. I did that, you? Like, but I saw the package. When did you tell him? <laughs> oh. Tell Bertolotto. Tell Bertolotto that I saw the package. Yeah. Oh my god. 
<laughs> at 11.45 or that the time at 11.45 or that the time that I left the when house. When did you tell him that you saw the package at 11.45? <laughs> I don't know when I specifically told him that. Now, the, you also at one point had tried to file a complaint with the Modesto PD on me. Okay, didn't you? Didn't you call up the police and tell them that you wanted to file a complaint against me? Yes, I did. Okay, and did you tell them that the National Enquirer reporter had come to some place where you were and that person gave you a card and because they said they were from Los Angeles, you assumed that I must have sent them? No, that's not true. You didn't tell them that? You didn't tell the police that? No. What happened was somebody, I was at work, somebody said that there's a Bob Smith or a Bob White or whatever waiting to see you. And I went out. He introduced me as a person. He, and as I went out, he introduced me as a person from the Globe magazine and that he wanted to talk to me. The assumption I made was because you had made a statement during the day about some mystery woman that he was assuming that I was the mystery woman that had information about Lacey's disappearance. And so that's how I tied that together. And that's why I called the detective. I was very upset that somebody had come to my workplace to speak to me. That's not what you told the police though, is it? Uh, that is what I told them. Didn't you tell the police that specifically because the guy gave you a card and he's from Los Angeles and I'm from Los Angeles that therefore you think I sent the card? No. I sent him there. Excuse me, Mrs. Service. You answered the question. No. No what? No, that's not true because he never gave me a business card. So you never told the police that? No. Objection. It's, it's been asked and answered. Well, hold on. I'll just find that report and see if it refreshes her recollection. The answer is sustained. And may I have just one moment, Your Honor? You know what I'm going to do? Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the noon recess. How much longer are you going to be with this witness? How much longer? I'm going to be with this witness a little, <laughs> a little bit longer. But before we take a recess, can I just show her one thing? As long as it's not a Vienna sausage. Yes, identify what you're showing her. 17634 bait stamp. This is a report from Detective Bueller and... What's the date? What's the date? Oh, sorry. That's the, what's the date? <laughs> it would have been, it looks like, 5-9 of 2003. 5-9-03? Yeah. Service advised she wants to file a complaint against Mark Garagos, believing this visit was possibly tied to his involvement in this case, since the Globe reporter admitted they admittedly came from Los Angeles. Okay? Is that what you told the officer? Can I see that, please? Uh, yes, you can. Right there. Is that what you told him? Wait a minute. I haven't finished reading the sentence. Can I read it again, please? Can you let the witness finish reading it? Thank you, Your Honor. Can you just leave it here while I make my statement? Thank you. Uh, I don't believe that it was tied to your involvement in the case because the person was from Los Angeles, but it was because of the statement you made to the press. Did you tell the officer that you believe that because the Globe reporter is from Los Angeles Bureau, that I was from Los Angeles, and therefore you believe there's a connection? No, I believe it was because of the statement that you made to the press. Did you tell that to the officer, to Detective Bueller? I told him that. I was aware that was a statement had been made earlier in the day. Then there was some mystery woman out there, and I felt that it was tied to that. And so, 
That's why you wanted to file the complaint. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I'll resume after lunch. And Miss Service, we've got we've got to put you back on the stand. And Mr. Garagos, are you ready to proceed? I discussed with Mr. Destasso. I'm not going to ask any more questions. We got a couple more witnesses we want to try and rush through. You want to get through them, so you have no more questions. Questions on cross? I have no more on cross. Okay. Do we need to take a break for seltzer, chai? No, we just got a few any... more questions. It should take us five minutes with the cross and the oh, regret. Okay. Get okay. this done and get this witness off the freaking stand. Okay. It's you, Mr. DeSasso. You have the floor. I, I have a, just a couple of more. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, Ms. Service, I'm really sorry for the uh, defense counsel. Regarding the uh, 1018 time that you found the dog, did you, when you, after you found your Austin's uh, Christmas store receipt, did you write a note to Detective Bueller kind of detailing what you had done about retracing your steps? Yes, I did. And um, let me mark that. People's 30. People's 30. It's a note to Detective Bueller about Miss Service's actions. And is that the copy of the note that you wrote him? Yes, that's it. Okay. At what time is that in that note? Did you tell him about retracing your steps that you estimated what time you found the dog? At 10, 18 a.m. And well, what time of day of, of, the, of the note? The date at the top of the note is January 3rd, 2000. I put 2002, but it's actually 2003. Okay. And in that time frame that you have given us, is that corroborated by the receipt, People's 28, and your phone records of People's 29? Yes. Okay. And finally, there was one question that I forgot to ask you. When I was having you talk about the chart up here, People's 12, your house is on. If you're looking at the Peterson house, your house is on the left-hand side. Correct. On the right-hand side, do you know who lived in that home? Mrs. Rose Reed lived there previously. Okay. On, and then at some point in time, prior to December 24th, she was deceased. Yeah, she passed away. Okay. Was anyone living in her home on the right-hand side on December 24th? No. Okay, so it was vacant? She had furniture. I mean, the family had furniture in there, but there was no person living in that home. Okay, so... There was still stuff in there, but no one, no persons were actually living there. Right. Okay. Can you write, can you just write, use that blue pen again? That will be easier. Um, and just write, uh, read, uh, read home, I guess. And, you know, no one living there or something like that. Vacant. Put vacant. Put, put vacant. Oh, I'm sorry, Judge. <laughs> put vacant. However you want to put, put it. Yeah, just put it down. Put something down, please. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. No further questions. Mr. Garagos, any recross examination? Uh, I do. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Miss Service, th th this is your house that I'm pointing at right here. Correct. Right. And this over here is Scott and Lacey's. Correct. Right. And your bedroom is right over in this area. Is that correct? That's my bedroom right there. That's your bedroom window and their bedroom. Is in the back of their house. It's on the southwest corner. Okay. Of the back of the house. Now, do you see behind you what's been marked as People's 12? I do. In the upper left bedroom, that... The one that says master bedroom. And that's what you know to be the master bedroom. Yes, in their house. Okay. And the... What would you estimate the distance? Right there, we got the photograph. What would you estimate the distance between your house and theirs, uh, the wall, from the wall of your house to the wall of theirs? Well, I know that the wall of my house to my fence is about four feet. It's approximately another three to four feet to the edge of the house. You want to use this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would be, it's different in different parts because this cuts in. Okay. So it's close by their dining room, uh, very close, actually, within three, three feet of my fence. And then it's another three to four feet where my house is here 
but then it's a little wider here where the bedroom and bathroom and where it goes back to the spa. Well, would you estimate that from uh, your house, the master bedroom area is approximately 10 to 15 feet at most? I can't say for sure. I can't say for sure, but that would be a fair assessment. Could be more than 15, but that sounds about right. Okay. And you would estimate that it's less than 15 from the dining room area to your house? Yes, less than 15. Okay. Then I didn't ask you. I think I asked you at the preliminary that you had never seen Mackenzie out by himself before that day on the 24th. Isn't that correct? Well, I had seen him by himself, but not with the leash on. Not with the leash on. Yeah, I had seen him. Dogs get out, so... And uh, when you left that day, on the 24th, you did not see Scott's truck, correct? At the end of the day. In the morning or at the end of the day? At the end of the day, you did not see the truck. When I left my home? To go to Ripon. I did not see Scott's truck. truck. You did not see his truck? I did not see his truck, excuse me. Okay, all right. Uh, did they have Christmas lights? Yes, they did. Uh, were the Christmas lights on when you left? I don't recall if they were on or not. No, thank you. I have no further questions. Uh, Judge. May this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Thank God. Yay! <laughs> oh, that was ridiculous. <laughs> I think I think he makes those witnesses belligerent. They're they're like instead of him treating them as hostile, they they treat him as hostile. They're like you know, like jeez, pulling teeth. Oh my gosh. Oh, that was I didn't watch I didn't watch this trial. No, so neither I didn't. did I. So this is all I had no idea about it sounds like he's very friendly with the neighbor what does she look like how old is she where the bedroom window was right where's your bedroom window i'll be there tonight looking in like are you do you hear lacy and scott like you know what scott was like chris watt like he was a yes man to lacy it sounds like and then instead of just divorcing her, he just freaking kills her. But he had more affairs and stuff, and I think... I mean, he was obviously less... I don't think he was... I don't think he was cast for her, like Chris, but... I think he had a lot of romantic involvements, too, where Chris didn't... Yeah, like, he could... He could actually... He was a better-looking guy than Chris Watts. Yeah, Chris Watts. The best he ever looked was right before he, when he killed his wife. And that's how he got NK. And, oh, my gosh. But, I mean, in I terms of, like, the being... So I can oh, sorry. But, like, in terms of being yes-men to their wives, you know? And then they, pent, they have all this pent-up, like, rage or whatever. And then just no, I don't think it's rage. Really don't. Well, I think it's inner anger... But but they don't they don't what do you call it like they don't burst or what what do you call it? Hi, Lisa uh, H, Lisa D. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Was your agent, Caroline, your agent, your agent didn't stay till the end. Your agent didn't stay. They don't like yeah, it. Wasn't overkill, like you know, like get stabbed fifty two times or whatever. They're calm about it, but. No, not at all. He cleaned up probably the best. And, you know, so they only found her torso, right? Mm-hmm. And, and from, like, water is, like, the worst thing for identifying cause of death. So they couldn't tell anything from it, could they? Like, um, what her cause of death was? I do need my bath. I, I was know. just oh. going to take it when I came on. I, I can't even. Do, I, when she, I, Carolyn came on, I mean. I don't want to be gruesome, but did, did, did she, she have a, was her head there? That's I don't know. I, I think it was just the torso. So I'm almost wondering, I mean, because didn't he make, he made the anchors, but then 
I'm wondering if he made, if he put her feet in cement blocks or something. I don't know. Well, and then there was... We'll go through the trial. Because think... you know, some of us, you know, we're working, we didn't get to see the whole trial. So we'll, we'll go through it all. Because we'll... there's a, a creator, and I don't even know the name of the channel, but she, it's like two people, and it's two women, and one of the women thinks he's innocent. And so she, out, and she's intelligent. Um, and so I'm like, and she outlined the discrepancies in the trial. And so, I mean, she didn't convince me, but so it just made me think about different things. But we don't know a lot. And, you know, Scott was smart to not say a word and to maintain his innocence. Like, he was smart to do that. The way but I hope, I hope he doesn't was. get off. Well, we don't know that they're going to retry the whole trial. <clears throat> we don't know that yet. Just the, uh, the, the penalty, uh, phase, penalty right phase right now. Yeah, because the uh, there was a reporter that talked to the juror that caused all of this, and apparently she feels really bad. Yeah, strawberry shortcake. And they never asked her. You know, they asked her if she'd been involved in a lawsuit. And she said no, because she didn't think of a restraining order as a lawsuit. Right. <clears throat> and to laymen, you wouldn't think a restraining order is a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't, if you don't know the law, if you don't know, you know, so she, and it was, I forget, I want to say it was for theft or something, like her ex, her boyfriend's ex-girlfriend mm -hmm. yep. stole mm -hmm. something of hers or something. So it was like, a restraining order for theft and you know she's she thinking, well, here we have a, a murder case you know like it's not the same thing and it wasn't a lawsuit so because they think i initially thought gosh what is you know she lied just to get on the you're jury you're probably talking about the a and e thing no i'm talking about someone that um no. had on no but i mean they're probably talking about the points in the a and e thing that that are that they're saying that that he might be innocent oh. Oh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I don't know, but it was not, a reporter Trisha had not on innocent. Anyway. one night. And he actually keeps in touch with this juror. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. And I know. now, oh, you, okay, you know who's got from the Modesto B. And now he's like the editor of the. Right, whatever. Mm, yeah. I don't know. I mean, he, he, made, a, a, he made good points. Because I had no idea. I was just like, God, this juror was an idiot. Like, you know, but it's like, no, she made a mistake that a lot of people might have made. Mm -hmm. And just like Ms. Service said, nobody asked her if she saw the package at 1145. She you know, and. She, but she should and, have told them she saw the package at 1145. Well, yeah. But the judge is always like. It really wasn't right of her question. just to accuse me because somebody was from Los Angeles. There's a lot of people from Los Angeles. Right. Who filed Complain That's against me funny. at the police station. That was it's really... like, how many people are from Los Angeles, you know, right? The bad Brad rap. She just, she just painted me as a bad guy. Like 20 million people or something, and it's like, well, you're both from Los Angeles. Yeah, I have a lot of people from Los Angeles. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I don't know. A little Did you get to bike ride today? No, rain, but rain. But guess what? Jimmy came home with a canoe. What? I told you, cleaning out that basement. Oh. Does he need a canoe? It's like, we can use you... a canoe. It's $500. He's like, and then Doug said, you know, take it. It's take new? It. It's, it's a very nice canoe. Pelican well, canoe. That's good. Oh, the boys will love it. So, yeah, he's like, take the canoe. I forget why he said, take it. Yeah, we don't use the canoe. Take the canoe. I like the canoe. Jimmy I went like down, canoe. down. Jimmy was... <laughs> No, wait a second. Did he have the canoe with him? He saw my sister because my sister was up. And, oh, I knew why I couldn't go for a walk. I had vertigo. That's why. It wasn't raining. It's raining now. It was It was not raining. It was okay. It wasn't sunny. Um, but I had vertigo. I got so, I felt like I was going to vomit. I had a Santa bucket next oh. to me to vomit in. It was horrible. Okay. So um, I couldn't go. But then he said he was driving down the road on his bike 
with an inner because he got this really nice tube he said with like drink holders that so he put it on the tube and he was driving the bike and i think he was holding the canoe no he could there's no way he could have held the canoe but he had something else he must have went back jimmy, to the canoe. jimmy was doing all this yeah, he was driving the bike with an inner tube and something else that the guy gave him he, he could have held the system. canoe he was like no, he, he held the, the world There's title no of weightlifting. Right, but he he got the canoe. I'm sure he didn't have the canoe. He had something else, and he was driving down the road, and my sister saw him. Oh no! Hi, and Sarah. Happened? And he said she said hello through like gritted teeth, only because somebody else was there. Uh, he said hello, Marilyn. No. She says I'm like hello. So we she act couldn't, she better couldn't in know company. That somebody was with her. Right, because no, somebody was with Jimmy, so she didn't want to look like a real oh, oh. oh like that, you know, horrible, like not even a hello. Oh. What is she just? Does she have like a a tumor in her head? No, I'm kidding. I mean, it can make you change your personality. That sounds exciting. We well, we have three. That's the third canoe now. Wow. What's the what's the inner tube the floater like with the drink holder? What, well, I don't know. I didn't see like? it. He goes like this. He said, you know, he said, yeah, this, and he's like, you want that? He's like, yeah, it looks good. Because we were looking all summer for uh, one for she well Shelly for Shelly, she bought one yeah. and it's not comfortable. Oh yeah. So he uses the one that I always use, oh. and I've been trying to find one in her too. Yeah, I'll have to tell you what it looks like. I, I, I didn't see it. Do you know what I wanted to say from the other night, talking about Ron Kransky or whatever the heck Kransky, his name is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When he would go fishing in like floaties. Yeah, that's so weird. I've never heard of anybody doing that. And it would be yeah, so neither. cold. And and weird, like and sharks just, could get you. I just stuff. don't well, I just don't know of any like how that would be comfortable. Now I know people fish in waders, but they're standing and they stand chest deep. So why they're chest waders, but to be yeah. in a tube and then try casting it like in a tube and then what are you gonna do? Get to right. this, it's like a big come on, I don't understand that. And what yeah. and it's not even like a raft or like where do you put all your stuff? Where do you put well, your why fish? Why not get a little uh, like a little uh, bass boat or something like Scott? A little dinghy. Get a dinghy. Yeah, there you have come a on. Little, yeah, something. Say dinghy in a Garagos accent. No. Gritted teeth. No. Let me take. Who's going to participate in the uh, first cookie baking exchange? Who's I want to, but I need to get the ingredients. I've oh. never made. I want to make gluten free either black and white cookies or snickerdoodle. Okay. Well, and I'm not a baker, so that, it's not going to be. Well, that'll be fun. Comedic relief. Okay, but here's it, the rules. <sighs> Everyone needs to be on camera, of course. You don't have to have your face. If you don't want your face on, you can use your hands, but your your recipe has to be visible, okay? Um, and then you have to bake your cookies from start to finish. No cheating, no pulling out a box. If your cookies don't come out, they don't come out. You, you don't score well. At the end, everybody will show up their cookies and then exchange recipes. If people like them, they can ask, how did the cookie come out? You can explain the texture or whatever, and you can explain about your recipe. So. I was thinking of doing this. What's today? Tuesday? Mm -hmm. No, Wednesday. Tu well, it's yeah. Tuesday because yeah. we haven't gotten to bed yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm supporting this channel on Friday for We Have. For We Have? What is that? For We Have. I'm supporting this channel on, on Friday, Friday for We Have. What does We Have? I don't know. We, we Have. Hypo, maybe. Okay. So, for, Okay. For soup, for you're reporting this channel on Friday for Super Chat, Maggie Smith. What in the world are you talking about? She's got. Oh, she's Rob supporting. I thought she said she's reporting. I'm like, what is no, she? No, supporting, supporting. Oh, okay. I thought you said you're reporting. I'm sorry. I'm still in Garco's mode. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Sorry. 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 Okay. No. See, but no, you can't, I want to, if I can stay awake. That's not the right thing. It's got to be, we're going to do it early. We're going to do it early. Um, 10 o'clock. Hi, Lisa. 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday. What is Friday's date? The 30th? Yes, uh, I believe. The 30th? Wait. 
It's not really a competition, Augie. It's it's. I can't stop talking yeah, about that. Yeah, it's the thirtieth. It's, it's like a cookie uh, exchange, and and we'll see how it goes. Uh, maybe we'll never want to do it again. Maybe it'll go so well they'll say let's do it next Friday. Uh, Friday, 10, 10 p.m. Who's going to be there? Because if nobody's going to be there, this Friday at ten. Yeah. Everybody's got big plans. I bet. I'm eighty okay. percent in. I just need to get the ingredients here. Yeah, I don't know what I'm gonna. I don't even have a recipe yet. Yeah, I'm gonna have to look online. Uh, it's very easy. Come on now. There must be some cookie you bake. Your mother has all those cookbooks that you're always looking through. Well, no, I have to have. No, I'm talking to Scooter. She reads. Oh. It. She reads the cookbook. She says she doesn't have a cookie to bake. No, I said I'll figure out what I'm gonna bake. Okay, I I'm used sorry. to bake a lot of them. But didn't you tell stuff. the reporter that you said? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't get out of that mode. I know, it's funny. It could be a oh, cookie, that was great. it could be a that square. Was great. Some of the words you said. I, I, I don't even thing. read through, so I don't even know what's coming up. <laughs> the big chicken, the bird chicken yeah. fiasco of 2002. I know, I feel like the chicken, I felt like so much like chicken. And we need some merch from that. We need some Garagos merch. Yeah, yeah. Uh. <laughs> Chicken fiasco on mommy rambling. Did you report me? <laughs> it was so good. I love that. Oh my goodness. You're really scary, too. <laughs> I know. And you're, Scoot, you're grabbing your pillow like, oh. Hi, Rosie. Hi, Rosie. You'll be there. Lisa will be there. So I'm putting Lisa down. I'm down. Lisa. I'm down. Okay. I'm going to figure it out. Hi, Lisa D. Cupcake. <laughs> Cupcake, you should bake, too. Yeah, well, I'm going to bake some cookies. Suki, too, cookie. said she can make cookies, too. Who, who did? Suki, too. Oh, Suki, too. Okay. That's Friday at 10 p.m. Eastern. Eastern. So, 8 o'clock. Here. But I'll be on my feet standing or moving around. I would love to do this. I wish I can, but I can't be on my feet standing or moving around. Could you get a rolly chair? Yeah. That's a good That's idea. Cool. Have all your ingredients uh, out, Danielle. Have all cool. your ingredients out and just sit there and, and just combine. Yeah. And you've got I need a chance to get that it. could be Oompa Loompas or something. Here, put this in the oven. Here, take this out. Everybody can get... make whatever cookie they want, uh, uh, Sarah. Sarah, yeah. you can make whatever cookie you want. You don't have to make Italian cookies. Everyone's not making chocolate chip. Who's making chocolate no. chip? I'm not, I'm not making, making those. Chip. I'm not doing those. And even if everybody was making chocolate chip, your chocolate chip is different than somebody else's. Yeah. But nobody's making it. I mean, I'm not making it. Somebody might, but I'm not. Yeah. Okay. You're, are you in then, Sarah? I'm putting you down. You're doing gluten free, Suki. Suki's doing gluten free. Yeah, see. Oh, you, wait, no, Suki. Okay. And I'm going to do low glycemic, so I'm probably going to use like coconut sugar. I don't know if anybody baked with that, but I'm trying it. We need a shirt that says order in the court. Okay, I've got to write that down. It's on my list with the other shirt somebody said. Hi, Rosie Posy Crafts. Oh, I got a telephone call. Okay, I got to take this. I'll be right down. Hi, Diana. Okay. Hi, Diana Maroney. Scooter, should we sing a song or something? Okay. What do you want to sing? I don't know. So I fear a female mm. deer. Just kidding. Or <laughs> rain, raindrops on roses and whiskers on mm. kittens. Bright copper kettles and warm wool and mittens. Brown I don't paper really know that, packages. Keep going. Oh, it's from... Um, it was string. These are a few mm -hmm. of my favorites. I can't sing. Oh my gosh. I'm tone deaf. Um, what do you like to sing? Um or anything. any jokes. Um, I can't think of any right now. My mom, whenever she would I don't even know, random times, she would just start singing this Spanish song called Volare, whoa, like just randomly. Like yeah, if, yeah. There, if, if, if the moment arose, 
and everything got quiet, she would just roll on it. And it's like, I didn't have half a chance to be shy. Let's just be clear here. <laughs> so, so I'm going to looking up gluten-free. I'm going to try black and white cookies because I love me a black and white cookie. I, are those like uh, those marble type or something? Yeah. Well, it's like, it's like a cake cookie, but it has half of it. Half of the frosting is chocolate and half of the frosting is white. And Ooh. there's like, it, like Seinfeld has like an episode. Oh, oh ooh, gluten-free. Mm, this looks good. Oh, see, I'm going to yes. have to modify the, the recipe. Yeah, whatever you need to I, do. I love, I love scones. I love cake. I love like thick. Mm. Me too. I, I miss all that. Oh, <sighs> cupcake! Cupcake says she might, but she's not sure if her oven is working properly. Maybe she'll make no bake cookies. Oh, those are good though. What is those, that? You know, those are those. Uh, the cocoa, the chocolate cocoa like with the little uh, balls. Yeah, like you roll them. Well, Ooh. you usually drop them by spoonfuls on a cookie sheet, and they just harden. Oh, oh gosh, they're so good. They yeah, just I like used to make like peanut butter, like bonbons, things like that. Yeah, those you know peanut butter bonbons. You know what would be good is like cocoa with coconut. Mm, I'm a coconut fan. Yeah, that's okay. good too. Yeah. Okay, these cake-like cookies are perfect when you can't decide between vanilla or chocolate frosting. Yeah, but see, that's where the, the big sugar is going to be. Yeah. And, and here it says, those of you who love Seinfeld know what I say when I mean that this cookie pretty much became famous after an episode of Seinfeld. You know what's funny is here in Colorado, we I never knew what a bagel was. You didn't? We didn't no, we didn't have bagels. Are you serious? We had tortillas. This used to be Mexico. I mean, come on now. Yeah, but you would think. Like, I didn't even go to school with bagel? anyone Jewish. Like the school I went to, there was one black person. Like, really, it's like, it's just. We're in Indiana. I went to college. I know now we do, but I'm talking like early 80s. Like, I went to college oh, older. Okay. And then there's like bagel you know, Einstein's bagels and stuff came out and, and I have like three Jewish girls on my, on my floor, on my, of my dorm. And like, and then I moved in an apartment with one of them. And so I like would do the Friday, I forget what the dinner was called, Shabbat. So I know a lot about Jewish stuff. And then one, I, one of my best friends, she would always throw me a birthday brunch and she's very Jewish. She runs like, uh, she's like the executive director of like several like synagogues and things. Like uh, she runs the programming and all that. And okay, but, oh, I need but it's to, interesting. Um, answer, I need to answer oh, Suki too. One minute, Suki too. Okay, uh, you need to get in the Slack group by November sixteenth, the two year anniversary of my son in law's suicide. Oh, mm. awful, Suki, too. I'm sorry to hear yeah, that. We need to remember to tell Carolyn that so she yeah. can get you in there. I think she's going to try to get everybody in Slack this week. Right. Definitely before the cookie. The Lisa cookie. D, Danielle C, help me remember to tell Carolyn. Um, do you want me to send her an email? Huh? Do you want me to send her an email? Yeah, sure. I'm never on my... Put in the title, put uh, Suki too. Um, Suki to Slack, maybe. Um, Anna says, I can't be on camera, but I am a professional baker, and I've got some great gluten-free cookie recipes if anyone needs a tip. I do. Yes. Can Anna. you put it in Slack in the craft? Anna, can you put them in? Are you in Slack, Anna? I'm not watching chat. Yeah, I'm looking for you. 
see, you know. Does Suki want to be added to what channel? Well, wait, she hasn't answered. Oh, you, you know I what? mean, uh, oh, I think uh, in the grief group. The grief group in Slack. Okay. okay. I'm back now. Okay. Suki too needs to be added to the grief group in Slack also, Carolyn. Oh, okay. You want to I'm put it on your list? I'm sending you an email. Okay. It needs to be by added. November uh by November sixteenth. It's no the anniversary of her son in law's suicide. Oh, okay. Second right. anniversary. Well, I'll get you hopefully in there tomorrow. All right. Uh, oh, boy. Okay. Son in law. Okay. All righty. So, what time? But, is um, it? who was it that said that about the recipes? Oh, uh, that was Anna. Anna, Sorry. are you in Slack? Yeah. Can you put the recipes in Slack or put your email and I'll contact you? Thank you, Sun Kissed Adrift. Cupcake might uh, come on baking Sun um, Friday. Her oven may not be working, but Ooh. she might do a no Cupcake? bake cookie. Cupcake. Yep. Oh, okay. And uh, there, I, I have a no bake cookie. If your oven's not working, I have a no bake cookie. That's what she said. She oh, said she I have do one in that. here. I have a recipe in here. Uh, maybe I'll tomorrow if I'm ambitious and I get it done, I'll create a cookie baking Slack group or something. I don't know. Or we, I don't know. Or we could go in the. What is that? What well, kind of in there, but she that? said she would love to be added to Who's Slack. That? Anna. Anna, you have to send me an email. To you just just go put exclamation point email and, and Nightbot will get you the email. I have an idea. When Carolyn comes back, we can plan something. What? What idea? I want Anna? to be in the Slack group. Pit it's Bull pink. Sleuth. Weren't you in the grief? You're not in the grief group. It's pink. Are you in Slack? It's pink. I sent you a new invitation. Did you get it? I think you're in there. It's pink. I'm very certain. You got it. I sent you a new invitation. No, no. I sent you a new one. I'm fairly certain you're in there. I'm going to shut my camera off and I'm, I'm, start back to the tub. I'm going to write it. You're going in the tub now? You're going to fall asleep. No, it'll relax me after all that interrogation. <laughs> yeah. You got her blood pressure up. There it goes. <laughs> Dang, I was even like, I was glad I was on mute because I'm like, oh. <laughs> Can you imagine if somebody just tuned into the channel at that time? Like, what the hell is going on in there? There's drama in there. She said that the scooter reported her to the police. She's a tyrant. Can you imagine that? I've never seen her like that. She was, she was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Say that she reported her to the police. I didn't know oh she lived God. in Los Angeles. I thought she was in New York. Okay. Where'd you get that accent? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I would I almost want to see the trial and see how he actually asked. See, the but I don't think that trial was televised. Oh I really don't think it was because they have all those sketches. It. Wow. Let me see. I'm, I'm going to see that because I know my mother was into that trial, but I, I don't think it was televised. Let me see. I think only parts of it. Yeah, I think only parts. I That's think you're why right. you can't watch the trial like you can Jody Arias. Why didn't yeah. they televise it? Because it's too small? I don't know. Let's see. It says, uh, let's see. I hate when judges don't televise. Like, come on now, we have the technology. I mean, we're so spoiled now with cops and their body cams. I mean, they go first, first interviews, everything. You have the, like, yeah. Like, Chris Watts was kind of an ideal case, man. We had it all. Shanann, social media, and then the body cams, and then Nicole, like, calling right away. Like, 
hours later. Yeah, I don't think. Let's see. I don't think we'll ever get a case like that again. With no courtroom video and no on-camera comment from the principal's interest in the child that dwindled the case. Oh, uh, Lisa D says. Only for 10 minutes only on July 29th. So that was, hold on. So what Lisa D said, what? She says, Carolyn Pitbull and I are interested in doing more paper folding and want to pick a date to do some of it if others are interested too. Okay, who's interested in the paper folding? Uh, I'll watch it. We could do some paper folding. I don't know, maybe between cookies. Uh, who knows if they're in the oven? What about that? Yeah, like it. Yeah, like people can bake cookies or. It could actually be a party. It, we could have like a party. It could be a bunch of things for the thirty thousand stuff. Yeah, cookies, right. paper folding, um, special guests. Like so, diamond painting could be a lot of things. decoupage. Yeah, lots of things could be a lot of things. Um, what else? Yeah, a lot of people want to do it. Suki too. Costumes. Sassy you could wear a costume because it's so close to Halloween. Oh yeah! You could dress up totally. Like, uh, Julia. Child oh my god! Or Julia. Child oh, I'm happy. Or, uh, or uh, Paula Dean, or um, who's the other one? Uh, the Pioneer Lady, or Guy Fieri, or I don't even Lord know. Ramsey. What do I want to be this year? Two years ago, I wanted to be Cardi B so bad, and then last year I was Takashi Six Nine. <laughs> I had rainbow hair, so I don't even know. I have to think about what I want to be. What, what did she say? I can't see her response. Did she say? What did you guys say? Could it be the same night, Pitbull? Yeah. It'll be smorgasbord. How do you come on Friday, Sarah Nash? You you get a number. You you go through Zoom. If you're in Slack, or you, you don't even Carolina. have to be in Slack. You just I'll can get Carolina, the number. Carolina will email you. Yeah, just email, and we'll get you set up. Don't worry, I will be doing the paper folding with you guys. Anna, email Carolyn your email and so I can contact you to get the gluten-free recipes. Oh, she's making chocolate chip cookies. I think it's Suki that's making the gluten-free. Or, Su or Sarah is? Yeah. No, yeah. Anna said yeah. she's not baking, but she has a lot of gluten-free oh, recipes. Anna, right. Anna. But she's not in Slack, but I said just she can email you, right? And then you can send me her email address, and then I'll get it. All right. Because I honest, I don't. I'm not a baker at all. How come the how come Nightbot? What happened to Nightbot? He went on strike. Oh, there he is. There, yeah, he's there. Took a long time. He went. Yeah. He went in the corner with Nicole Griffin. Griffith. Yeah. No I'm kidding. <laughs> Anyway, mommy, any night is good for me. Okay, well, let's just do Friday as a party night and everything. I don't know, Friday. But I've got to get costumes, yeah. costumes. Oh, Frida Kahlo. Maybe I'll be Frida Kahlo. That'd be a good one. Mm hmm. If I have to go to bed, I'll, I'm exhausted. I'll have a unibrow. The braid across my head. My neck is wasted. So, um, yours are full of gluten. Good. Mine are full of gluten, too. All right. If you can eat gluten, eat it and enjoy it. I'm going to bed too, too. honey. Good Good night. Thank you, everybody in the chat. Thank you, everybody on the panel. Nana Patty, uh, Scooter, Alicia, um, everybody in Thanks. the chat. Thank you to the moderators. Uh, first of all, that need them. God bless everybody. See you tomorrow. Uh, bye. Love Good you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks, bye. Carolyn. Good night. Let me shut this one down. Shut it down.